Welcome to Analyzing Mormonism again. Um, so we are going to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment some more. We have invited um, Kelly Whitey Jones, and she's here with us today, and she's going to help us talk about the Equal Rights Amendment and the church's stance or the church's response to it. Um, so uh, Kelly, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? You bet. You bet. I am a an educator. I teach on the college level. I teach intercultural and interpersonal communication. I am a mother of three. I grew up in Orem, Utah, and I live now in North Salt Lake. I am the youngest of eight children and wow. had a very kind of conservative uh, LDS upbringing in Orem. We call it Happy Valley for good reason. And I've been working in spaces around equal rights. I see them as very connected. And so since about 2016 is when I've really dug in to advocacy work. Uh, I was part of a group that resurrected the Equal Rights Amendment in 2016, 2017. And I've worked with four different legislators now to bring a bill to help ratify the ERA because Utah has never ratified. Wow. That, I'm not surprised. <laughs> the Utah has not done that, but <laughs> okay. So we have a slideshow presentation, um, as per usual. Yeah, yeah, that's what we always do. Okay, so I wanted to talk about. So this hit its rise, and you said 1972. Is that right? That is. It's hit its peak, and then they had a timeline there. The original timeline was seven years, and then it was okay. extended three okay. more. Okay, extended three more years. Okay, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's like a whole decade um, of us trying to figure out how to get it ratified. Um, and that's so people say that the yeah, and so to today in 2023, it's been um 41 years since the since the end date right from 1982 um, right. People say that's, yeah people are like it's too long it's it's the deadline's just way too far gone 41 years that's just we can't do it but i wanted to remind everybody that the 27th amendment took 202 years to ratify you said it was the first one ever um presented was, right mm -hmm. yeah and i so anyway we're not certainly we're not at 200 years yet so I think we're fine on the deadline part, but also it's just ridiculous to be like, there's a timeline. You guys hurry up and figure it out or we're just not going to pass it. Like that's, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> there really could be no time limit on equality. And I, you know, you been 10 years of trying to figure it out. That's we're at a hundred years now of trying to figure that's it out. That's true from 1923 yeah. when it was first written. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. It was first proposed 1923, right after women, white women had gained the right to vote. And so that was the very next thing they felt was so important was to ensure that women were protected legally in our constitution. And so Alice Paul, who had been so instrumental in the, in the suffrage movement, um, she was kind of considered this young upstart that went to England and gathered all these radical ways to protest and brought them back to the US, but that she was so instrumental in getting that through and then she and Crystal Eastman, who went on to co-found the ACLU, she the, the two of them sat down and penned the Equal Rights Amendment. And it was presented 100 years ago uh, this year in Seneca Falls, New York. And uh, is it my understanding that the, the, the ERA has gone through three different um, uh, editions or yeah. whatever they're called? It's had a few different iterations. So um, in 1943, it was revised, but it had to be revised by the original author. So that did happen. It was written initially in 1923, then revised in 1943, and then uh, ultimately passed to both houses of Congress in 1972. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I love the history about with Alice Paul and, and all that. Okay, so actually, she did not live long enough to see kind of what happened. Maybe it's fortunate, maybe it's unfortunate, uh -huh. um, but clear until um, she did pass away. She, I think 1977 is when she passed. And so things were still unsettled with the ERA, but she worked on this singular issue the rest of her life. Wow. That is so incredible. Okay. So one of the things that the church in response to all of this in 1980, it says March, but it was actually February. They made this little booklet here. Um, it's, it was published by the Enzyme magazine um, in responding to the concerns of the ERA and they were and why the why they call it a moral issue and why they're against ratifying the ERA. And so I just want to we're going to read. So it just says the ERA is a serious moral issue and its passage could significantly affect the standards of right and wrong that are vital to us as a religious people. 
And that's basically what they're trying to argue is that this is a moral issue when we should not, we should not ratify it. We should not put it into our constitution. Um, so, so I want, so I brought Kelly here today so that we can like respond. The church lays out, I only have six laid out, but they have a little bit more, but it's basically these, these six ones, their concerns are abortion, legal, legalizing same-sex marriage, um, women being drafted in the military service, um, the negative effects on the family, the erosion of parental responsibilities, and the erosions of the division of power. And so we're going to kind of talk about these and how what the church says about these things, and then reality, I guess, or like yes. what, why those maybe aren't issues anymore. Um, or we're ever. <laughs> or, or, or we're not issues. <laughs> okay, so the first topic is abortion. Which is a big one. That's that's controversial. <laughs> yes, it, yes. Um, do you want to read the church's stance on abortion? Okay, so what would be the impact of the ERA on abortion? Any reasonable chance for reversing the accelerating trend of courts to grant abortion on demand would probably be eliminated. It could affect issues that have yet to be decided, such as whether parents of minors must be notified and whether government funds will be involved. I love that they use this trigger word, like this, like abortion on demand, on demand. like as if, like if you went to a, into a hospital with a broken ankle and they're like, oh, she's going to get surgery on demand. Like you get medical procedures when you need them. They're not like, like it gives this, this visual to me, like when, when something's on demand, it's happening all the time. Like it can mm -hmm. just happen at a whim yeah, and that's not, you feel like it. Yeah. That's not a compassionate stance, right? As we think about the impact of that difficult decision of, of deciding your own reproductive future, right? Um, and I would like to reiterate that the church's stance has been much more compassionate. About seven years ago, I jumped on their website and I, I read an entirely different stance when it came to abortion. It read that a man and a woman, of course, should sit and counsel together. They should consider the woman's health they should consider their economic well-being. They can invite a clergy person to be involved uh, in that decision, but ultimately left the decision up to the family. Uh, oh, that so has been changed within the last two years. Oh, so if you go online now, the word that wording can be found under contraception. But yeah. essentially, the wording that is there now on LDS.org. It really echoes the Texas law that essentially penalizes anyone who is associated with a woman, um, helping a woman find access to reproductive health. And it's uh, it's I seven years ago I was pointing people to that website as a compassionate, a compassionate religious policy, right? That I I was really proud of it. And, and pointed several people to it. And then to come and find that that has, has been reworded and reworked in light of what has happened with the overturning of Roe, Roe v. Wade. Um, I, it's in, incredibly disappointing, but more than that, it dishonors the fact that we can trust women to make decisions about their reproductive life. Right, if right. We, if we believe that women know their homes, know their families, are invested economically, are invested in uh, compassionately caring for their families. And we have to recognize that we can trust women to make those important decisions for themselves. And yeah. I do love that they, you know, initially encouraged counseling with those that care about you. I think that's amazing. But the new policy essentially means that if you counsel with the people you care about, they can turn you in and you can be up for religious discipline if you support a woman uh, accessing this kind of, of reproductive health care, you can face religious discipline. Is that grounds for excommunication? I don't know that. It doesn't go that far. So okay, but I would just encourage you to go just look on the church's website, just type in abortion. You'll see that new policy and then go visit contraception and yeah. you'll see what it, what it once was. Yeah. Just, you know, just six, seven years ago, a very radically different policy. Yeah. That, that is so compassionate. This old, the old stance on abortion. That is, I didn't know they said that. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. There it's like they're um, returning and pushing for a more fundamental um, perspective. Like the, there's so many Christian churches that are leaning into that as well. 
And they're like, well, I want to be with them. And so they were going to kind of push for those exact same ideals that they, uh, I'm really sad that they've made that change. No, it's such a colossal step back. For yeah. Women, for women yeah. in particular, how can we say that we care for women if we don't recognize this as health care? Yes. Um, if you remember, the church had a different stance on contraception. When I, that's how I became the youngest of eight kids. Um, my mom was encouraged to have as many kids as she could have. And she ultimately um, had, after during my birth, her uterus stopped working. They had to physically push me out, the doctor and my and, and nurse and my dad, because wow. the, the contractions stopped. And then right after I was born, she had a hysterectomy. I mean, her body was wrecked. And and so I, I do see these policies. I've seen them shift and change, but in in a more compassionate vein, right? Moving towards a more compassionate stance. And, and this one is a colossal step back and will absolutely mean that women lose their lives. That's uh, if you look at and see what's happening in Texas that has been restricting access to abortion for the past 10 years, um, actively shutting down clinics. There were only three active clinics in, te- in all of Texas before Roe was overturned. Um, wow. If you look at what's happening around maternal mortality rates, it's, they're trying to block our access to that data because of how horrific it is. And it impacts women of color on a much grander scale. Yes, yes. We do not even yet know those impacts and they are absolutely um, horrific to consider. Uh, We do know what happened in the 1970s, right? When women didn't have access and and pre-1973, when women didn't have access, they still sought abortion, but they they did not have access to a safe procedure. And I, I hate that for women. Um, I hate that they have to be afraid, um, that they have to consider doing something risky or scary uh, when it comes to their bodies. That's just mm-hmm. absolutely wrong. And in, in relation to the Equal Rights Amendment, abortion, they would always try and connect abortion um, to it. Um, as we know, abortion has been the law of the land my entire lifetime. It was I was born in 1973. And so up until this point, I, I've always had that, that bodily autonomy and that privilege and that right. And I, so their concerns, you know, obviously were unfounded in that the ERA was not passed in the 1970s and that abortion was legalized on its own merits under medical privacy law, suggesting that if men had the ability to have procedures with privacy, that women should also have access to procedures with privacy. And so that's essentially how uh, Roe came came to be law, um, and that came to be the law of the land is based on those medical privacy rights and nothing to do with the ERA. Wow. The that's difference crazy. now, <laughs> now things are different. And if you look at the case here in Utah, we have, uh, we have uh, a trigger ban that would have gone into effect, except for our equality clause in our Utah state constitution that was added in 1896. And if you read the language of that equality clause, it's the exact language of the Equal Rights Amendment. Oh, that's wow. so good. That case is being used right now <clears throat> to keep the trigger ban from being enacted. And it's the first time really that that has been tested. So it'll be very interesting to see how how things turn out here in Utah. There's a big push, obviously, to, to push past that and to put that trigger ban into effect. But, um, but I'm encouraged to see it being used. Um, ours was the only second state to have an equality clause put in. And it's believed that that language really did impact the writing of the ERA because the wording is so similar. That's really cool. Yeah, so I, so there's some statistics on abortion that I wanted to share. Um, So while most abortions, this is from cdc.gov, while most abortions take place in the first trimester of pregnancy, data from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention shows that less than 1% of abortions take place after 21 weeks of pregnancy. Terminating a pregnancy after 21 weeks is exceedingly rare. People seek third trimester abortions for two main reasons, because they learn new information such as about the health of the fetus, 
and I'd say for the mother as well, or because of barriers to abortion access, often as a result of state policies, like you were saying, where people don't have access, and so they have to go elsewhere to, to get this access. And that takes time. Right. Yeah. But yeah, only- and it takes money. And so we know that this will impact those who have less economic um, abilities. Uh, right. They don't have the same ability to get off work for three or four days to travel out of state. They right. don't have the economics to make that happen. So yeah. we know that like um, the people who are keeping this from being available, they're wives, daughters, girlfriends, friends, they're not going to have any problems because they can go and access whatever they need. It's the people who who are subject to this law and have no financial ability to overcome it that are going to be punished by this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the Equal Rights Amendment w- is important to this issue. So this is, they have, I may be good reason to be a little worried about it. And this is why. Um, in order for the for the Equal Rights Amendment to matter to abortion, they have to admit that they that limiting access is sex discrimination. Yeah. So as soon as they say that the ERA and abortion are connected, they are admitting, they are showing their hand that they exactly. know that they are discriminating on the basis of sex. They are, yes, one hundred percent. Yes. And so, and why does that matter? Why would they, <clears throat> sorry, why would two of my senators write to try and stop the archivist from signing the ERA into law? Why would they go to that trouble? They're very worried because they want to enact a federal ban on abortion, that we know that's their end game. They're starting with states. They're saying, oh, it's states' rights. But ultimately, we know that they want to make that the case nationwide. and. The the Equal Rights Amendment would really impact that because it would probably have less impact initially on state law. Much of our state law has been brought to be more neutral over time. It would have more impact on the federal level. So when a federal law is proposed, like, for example, a federal ban on abortion, it would have to pass through the Equal Rights Amendment once once fully certified it would have to pass through that filter to prove that it is not sex discrimination and there is no way that it could do so. Hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. That's super impactful that you said that. And I wrote that down as a quote from you that not allowing women abortion is sex discrimination. It's, it's tipping the hand and, and admitting that. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next, one of the next issues that the church brings up is LGBTQ marriage. Was there anything else you wanted to say on abortion? Just that I I recognize my own privilege in it. I recognize that this is going to impact women of lower economic status, women of color on a more grand scale. And um, do I think that this will stop abortion? Absolutely not. Do I believe it will stop safe abortion? I think it has that potential. Yeah. And I just want to ask a question that you probably don't know the answer to, but like, why are they so set against us having access to abortion? Because we've had access, like you said, since the seventies and it's been fine. Like people, like only 1% of, of third trimester babies ever are aborted. And it's always for medical reasons. Like there it's been proven to be the best situation for women in general because they can make decisions about when they want to have babies mm-hmm. they like a, a woman who who um, can't afford it isn't mentally capable isn't in a like in a safe situation she can make those decisions so why are they trying to take it back like what are they trying to force us to have more children because the the um, birth rate has gone down is like wouldn't it be more realistic to um, pay women to have babies because it's so expensive to have babies. It'd be worth it if it was free, you know, or whatever. But so when I think about why um, I, I have to believe that we are just in this moment historically of stepping back. Right. So it really is about walking back the rights of women to work. Um, When contraception was finally legalized, it made it possible for women to plan when and and how many children they wanted. 
it essentially made it possible for women to work without that access to contraception. It, it leaves women in these precarious situations, often meaning that they have to stay um, home or stay in an abusive situation or have less ability to plan their own future. And so why would, why would we be okay with this? Why would the LDS church be okay with this? Um, because, because equality and patriarchy cannot exist in the same place. Mm-hmm. And wow. because, because women um, run our world, <laughs> they run, they really do. They run our religious spaces, right? Our religious spaces run on the unpaid labor of women. And so do our society. So does our society here. And so th- this moment really is about taking us back when you hear them saying, you know, we want to head back to the 1915s. Things were so, so traditional and cut and dried back then. Everybody knew sort of their place. Um, what they are really saying is that they had their finger on women and women's right to choose their lives. And that has, we cannot allow that to, we cannot go back to that. We absolutely cannot. Uh, when we think about, you know, the higher rates of divorce, um, when you hear about women's ability to leave abusive relationships, though that didn't happen until around the 1970s when we, we were talking about women's rights and there was this massive push, right? We Women did not have their own financial life in their own hands, right? Until 1974, they couldn't open a bank account. 1978, they couldn't open a, they was when they could finally open a credit card without getting their father or husband to co-sign. Um, so without that financial ability, the ability to manage your own finances, you were trapped economically in marriage situations that were terribly unhealthy. And so when we we understand sort of these major shifts, right, that have happened, we, we know we just cannot, we can't allow these things to go back. And so there's never been, I don't think, a more important issue than bodily autonomy. And when I think, when I think to myself, the day Roe v. Wade was overturned, I was devastated. I, um, for the first time in my life, sorry, I felt like a second class citizen in my own country. And I recognize there's some privilege in saying that, right? Absolutely there is. Um, I'm a white woman. I've had access to education, right? Um, I have not faced a lot of the challenges that others face, but I, I, for my lifetime, I've had my bodily autonomy and to have that taken from me. I, over the summer, I went to a few parades. I don't know how to stand in a parade and celebrate a country that does not see me that considers me a second class citizen. I I don't know how to celebrate my country when it doesn't see me. I feel that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I feel that. My name is America and I feel that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, that, that was really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Okay, so the next issue that the church does talk about is LGBTQ marriage. Do you want to read this one? Yes. Okay, so they ask, what would be the impact of the ERA on homosexual marriages? Constitutional authorities indicate that passage of the ERA could extend legal protection to same-sex lesbian and homosexual marriages, giving legal sanction to the rearing of children in such homes. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we... And it was passed in 2015, right? The the, the marriage, uh, yeah. The, the uh, legalizing same-sex marriage. marriage. Yeah, so the ERA had nothing to do with that. No, Bostock like, versus Clayton County, that decision was huge, right, for um, for employment rights. It, it gave a, a huge bolster to the efforts for gay marriage to be legalized. We are in this powerful moment, but for the ERA, that was one of the huge fear tactics that they used in the 1970s to say, this is going to bring about gay marriage, right? This is going to uh, dissolve the the traditional family structure, right? Women are going to work. And if they can work, then my goodness, 
they won't have children and the family will just not exist, right? But also this idea that it would bring about gay marriage. And look what look what has happened with gay marriage. Like that has come about right with its own pathway. Are they right that the Equal Rights Amendment would help get um, ensure equal rights for all people? Yes, a hundred percent. Like. So, um, so here is something that we have to consider, though, and this is something to kind of temper that. Like, I think absolutely the goal of the ERA is that everyone would have equal rights. A couple of things, sticking points. So the courts will take a much more conservative approach. They will say, what was our understanding of the word sex as it appears in the ERA when it was written, 1923, when it was revised, 1943? And then when it was passed, 1972, and then ultimately when the ERA was finally certified. So we hope within the next couple of years, I believe it will happen in the next few years. Um, what was our understanding of that word sex? And you can see how our understanding of that has shifted and changed over time, right? So biological initially, and then and then really emerging to like a, a full spectrum and understanding understanding it so differently now. So we, a court is going to look at all of those aspects as they determine how it will impact. But there's a great sense of, you know, just as uh, the ERA helped push other, other movements, right, civil, civil rights movements. Um, one of our most powerful advocates was Shirley Chisholm, who mm -hmm. um, was the first Black woman to run for, dem for office of president as a Democrat and uh, was an amazing first woman representative from her state and then served like 30 years, 30 plus years um, in the US House of Representatives, amazing woman. And uh, she, she rose up and spoke to Congress on, on so many issues, but particularly this issue and talked about that need for intersectionality that we always strive for, right? But also that recognition like that the ERA is for everyone, right? And, and uh, those who, women of color, gay women, transgender women, they have layers of discrimination that they deal with every day. And the, we can never lose sight of that. Like we can never, Polly, Polly Murray was another um, amazing advocate from that time period. And she spoke in front of Congress about the Equal Rights Amendment and what it would mean for the LGBTQ community. So we, we've we had these powerhouse women in particular who have been working for this for so long. Um, and their example is what makes me get up every day and say, you know, we are facing a, a big obstacle it's a little bit when you're working in in equal rights. You're it's almost like pushing a big rock up a hill every day, yeah. um, and and some days you know you're better at it than others. But I'm so inspired as I look back at this history, right? And if we want powerful change to happen, we have to be engaged in the effort, even when it feels insurmountable, even when it feels so difficult. Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to point out, the so they say in here, and I, I don't know if I can find the page, but they were like, uh, we think that, oh yeah, he said, they say, in some cases, trends are already in motion in society to bring about the troubling changes listed above. We feel the ERA would accelerate these trends. And I say to that, I wish it had. Like the things that we have available to us now, uh, gay marriage, um, what we had, abortion access, um, equality in all of these ways, we have more now than we had at the time that it was written. But imagine if we'd had all of this back in the, the 70s, yeah. all the, all the, especially for, for gay rights, like the, the people that died from AIDS and all, that whole pandemic, they would not have died probably. Like there, there are so many things that we would have benefited from if this had been passed forever ago. And why shouldn't we have those things now? Why well, shouldn't they? We yeah. have to. Like, we have to have them now. And that's one of the arguments you'll hear is that, well, women, you know, women have made so much progress. They don't need the ERA uh, like they might have before. It's it's just absolutely bunk. Uh, you can see with the issue with Roe, how quickly rights that yeah. were settled so law, yeah. they, they were 50 years of settled legal precedent overturned in a moment. 
um, when they say, oh, well, women, you know, in the workplace, we've made things so much better. We just passed a pregnancy act to, to we're still trying to give equality to women in the workplace around pregnancy. Oh. So, so these efforts are not, they are ongoing because many of the things that we passed in the 70s have started to be walked back and watered down to the extent that women really are in a moment of having their rights walk back. Because the patriarchy is winning right now. Like it started to win as Trump was president and it has this like death grip on our society right now. I'm going to quibble with that word win. <laughs> it's having a moment. But if, having you look at, if you look at some of these mo other movements, this is a predictable situation where when you have amazing progress happen, like gay marriage being legalized, right? When you have these awesome things happening, you will always have a pushback moment. And that's where we are. We are in this moment of pushback. We cannot get discouraged. We cannot consider it winning. It's not a long-term win. It's a very short-term step back. And they will not stop that progress. They cannot. Okay. Yeah, it's a much that. more hopeful yes. view. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I need people to remind us that society is worth working on, that we don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. <laughs> And we can't get discouraged. My, one of my favorite quotes is about, um, I, I'm trying to think, I think it was Nelson Mandela who said that it always feels impossible until it's done. And that quote gets me very far <laughs> in terms of advocacy work. Like it just reminds me that we, um, we are working on a big project, right? Greater equality for all people. That's such a big project. Of course, it is going to take everything we have. That's a very good point. Okay, so going back to the LGBTQ marriage, this is the church's stance. And then I just think it was, I wanted to talk about this. Um, they say it, it will give, um, giving legal sanction to the rearing of children in such homes with LGBTQ parents. And I just think that's really interesting that they throw that in there um, because dozens of studies show that children with LGBTQ parents fare just as well, if not better, than children raised in homes with heterosexual parents. And so I just wanted to list off some of these studies because I, um, we're queer, we're a couple and like, we have a child, we want more, um, down the future in the future. But like, I just don't like this idea. So like the, in 2008, there was a study done by the center of surrogate parenting, where they said that for their school communities, they were also engaged. They were also more likely to be involved or engaged in their children's day-to-day -day educational life. So LGBTQ parents are more involved in school with their children's school and education. Um, and then the American Psychological Association, this was done in 2012, lesbian and gay parents are as likely as heterosexual parents to provide supportive and healthy environments for their children. So nothing wrong there. Life science in 2012, um, gay parents tend to be more motivated, more committed than heterosexual parents on average because they choose to be parents. And that's like one of the things with like the ability for gay couples to to have um, IVF or, or all of that kind of stuff or mm -hmm. to adopt surrogacy because mm -hmm, they're choosing that that's it's it's doesn't just come naturally so you have to we have to actually it doesn't plan come on, on accident it doesn't come on accident which is I feel like a lot of the the people who end up with kids and then sometimes a bunch of kids are the ones who are having them on accident and they can't take care of them and they don't want them mm -hmm. right right and I I think this is something to really be watching because as we we discuss bodily autonomy, we know that that there's also an effort on the part of those who do not support bodily autonomy to restrict IVF and contraception. So they've come out. Um, there was a, a leak here that was reported here in Utah uh, from a group in Tennessee. Like, if you don't mind, I'd love to read that really quickly. That'd be great. Yeah. It said, leaked audio of a strategy session between Tennessee lawmakers and Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America reveals the anti-abortion group telling politicians to wait a year or two before going after IVF and contraception. Oh my so God. We knew that that's sort of the end game. So when we talk, there's all this rhetoric around, we wanna strengthen the family. We wanna make sure you know, that the family is strong, um, th removing the ability of folks to have access to IVF is just is denying the reality of of those who struggle to conceive like and mm -hmm. and, um, and it, particularly in this context I just think it's such a low blow 
It's yeah. such a low blow. Um, I, you know, with the LDS church denying earthly love and intimacy to its members, as much as it's reversed some policies, the reality is still very much that if you are gay and Mormon, you are expected to abstain. You mm-hmm. are expected to just deny yourself earthly love. Mm-hmm. Um, deny yourself the possibility of a family, of having children. Can you imagine what that does to the psyche of our young people as they consider yeah. what they want their future to be? Yeah, it causes a lot of suicides. Absolutely. Well, when people try to, people, the church tries to compare like, oh, what about this single woman who is, who, this woman who's in her 40s that's single? She's the same as as a gay man who can't ever, but no, it's not the same because she, she can meet the love of her that. life next the next day. And he, this person cannot find the love of his life at all, ever. Like at all ever. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and they also promise, oh, you can find someone in the next life. Well, if you're a gay man, you're not allowed to find a gay husband in the next life. You have to find a woman. So your sexuality has to change in the next life in order for you to ever have a family. And like the, the, they say that family is the most important thing. They push the importance of family continually. And then they're like, but not you, you can't have one. Like how, how is that? Yeah. No, we can't have any exclusions. I I think that's what we have to learn from our past. How long will it take us to learn that? Um, With the Equal Rights Amendment, we have had to learn that. Um, You know, when I look back at women's suffrage, right, we won the right for white women to vote. It took five more decades for Black women and six more decades for Indigenous women. Oh, my gosh. And and how did that happen? Susan B. Anthony made a deal with the Southern states that they would vote for women's suffrage if they excluded women of color. Uh And and that decision, while I understand it, I think we can still appreciate the efforts that she made, but we have to be willing to look at what those kinds of exclusions mean to generations of women of color who had to wait for their basic right to vote that many more decades we just and and we're done with that like we will not accept exclusions no one will be left behind so their definition of family they're like oh we have to protect the family what is it that they're protecting from the homosexuals because a homosexual person can have a family they we have a family. We have and a, studies show that they're just as great, mm-hmm. if not better. So, like, so, yeah, I can't so wrap what, my hand around them. No, but I, I can. What they're protecting is a man's power over the family. They are protecting patriarchy. Absolutely. They are not concerned about families. They are concerned about the patriarchy. patriarchal control of the family. No, and yeah. and there's a reason that you see women leaving the LDS Church in really high numbers. Um, they are. I I think their compassion cannot. Um, cannot sort of square with the policies that they're seeing in place. I think women are waking up to the fact that their labor has been um, used and that they have undervalued more than what they thought. Um, Mm -hmm. I I know, just as an aside, in 2011, I went back for my master's and on campus, I kept running into these signs that were like, real women run. And it was the Rosie the Riveter, you know, showing her her arm. And it was this whole campaign to get women to run for office in Utah. And I remember thinking, why do we need a whole program to do that? And of course, like, it, it I just, I should have realized it because I was in the thick of it. But, but women in Utah are raising families and they are giving all of their extra time to their communities and to their ward communities, their state yeah. communities. <laughs> so there is plenty of labor that women are doing for their communities. But again, it is undervalued. It's unseen. It's invisible. It's unpaid. Right. Yeah. And, and I think as women are starting to wake up to that issue of emotion, labor, social labor that that typically does fall along gender lines they're they're insisting on something different. They're looking for more equal partnerships. Um, if I could give advice to the LDS church right now, I would I would encourage them to jump into that with everything they have, thinking about equal, what makes an equal partnership. Um, you can imagine structurally that that would be 
revolutionary, right? That would require a complete restructuring. But if they're interested in why women are leaving, if they're interested in why young people are leaving, um, they have to pay attention to this idea of equality. And, and it, it, it's never been, I think my efforts for equality have never been about one upping one other person. I have no interest in that whatsoever. Um, I'm only interested in ensuring equal rights for all of us. And until the church can get behind that idea, they will continue to bleed members. <laughs> so it's it's sad in a lot of ways because this idea that you want to choose your faith tradition, right? Um, as some of my gay family and friends have really struggled to leave Mormonism behind because it is their spiritual tradition of choice. Yeah. If and it's your believe, community. Yeah. If we believe that our spirituality is our own, which is a concept that we've been taught since primary, if we believe that is true, then we have to allow um, that that folks are are have the right to choose a community. The saddest part for me though is just that that religious community is not choosing them back and um, and is comfortable with doctrine and policies that come from the top that damage and hurt our LGBTQ community every day in the pews. Like that, um, for me, that's an issue I can't ignore. And I know so many who feel similarly, like church is meant to heal, not hurt. And when they see these policies hurting the ones that we love and care for. There's no way to there's no way to turn a blind eye to that. Like um, there's no way to resolve it. You can use all the magical thinking in the world, <laughs> and you can't square those kinds of things. Yeah. You were talking about the the language of like what did what 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 did they mean when they said sex in the 19, 1923 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. what, that still encompasses trans and non-binary and things like that? It will because they'll they'll weigh it out with when it was written and how we understand it now. Oh, okay. So it's so not it's not it's not a sure thing. Like I would never want to say that I know for sure that the courts will decide this way because the courts tend to lean more conservatively on right. these issues. And so um I'm encouraged to be honest by this idea honestly, when I think about starting over, what I would want to do with the ERA is what they considered doing in 1982 when they said, okay, the timeline has happened. What now? And so there were, really was this idea of like, we're going to try to get three more states to ratify. And that's what they ultimately went with. The other piece was, let's start over. Let's start over. But when we start over, let's make it even more inclusive. Oh, and okay. I, I love that. I want that. And, and if you look at Nevada, who was the first state to ratify uh, they, after the timeline, they ratified in 2017. And they have an amazing advocate who works there, Senator Pat Spearman, who's a woman of color. She's in the military. She's gay. And she, wow. she says she has experienced every type of discrimination there is. But she is a powerhouse um, she comes from a religious background. Her father was a, was a pastor. And when she speaks, people listen. Nevada just passed the most inclusive state ERA that we have in our country. Wow. And it's, it, the language of that is beautiful. And if I had everything that I wanted, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment would read like that state do you, ERA. Do you know the wording of that? Yeah, I can pull that up. Okay, this is what it says. Nevada voters have adopted what is widely considered the most comprehensive state version of the Equal Rights Amendment in the nation, a sweeping update that puts protections in the state constitution for people who have historically been marginalized. Nevada's ERA amends the state constitution to ensure equal rights for all, regardless of race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, disability, ancestry, or national origin. Wow, that is so cool. That just happened. It's, and it's not it even is. just sex, it's everything. Like it's that is so everything. cool. Yeah, it is so hopeful for me. That's the direction we're moving. Um, so 
we are constricted when we're working with the Equal Rights Amendment language right now. You know, we have plenty of people that say, well, why don't you just, instead of saying sex, why don't you just say women? Like there's a big push right now to do that. It's coming to state legislatures everywhere uh, where they are going to try to get us to insert women as mm. opposed to this idea of sex because it's so much more inclusive. Right. They're calling themselves feminists while they do it, but really they are anti-transgender. Mm. And uh, these you're going to see these, these efforts happen. Uh, it just happened in Kansas. It just passed in Kansas last year. This, and, this idea of women, like yes, changing it? Wow. And shifting it and ensuring like, we, yes, we want to protect women, but we want to make sure that it doesn't extend to other groups. <laughs> I mean, again, that exclusion policy. And um, and we it wouldn't work. It wouldn't, the, the language has to be this language in order to pass um, and to continue the process of certification. So okay. we've, we've gotten to ratification. We have all 38 states that we need. We need this timeline issue resolved, but it's looking very promising that we will have it resolved. Um, the House has already passed it two times and um, and the Senate, we just need the Senate then to pick it up or run it in the Senate and have the House pick it up, right? Um, mm -hmm. But we are at the finish line really for the national effort. And it's so exciting. It's so exciting to see that. We are constrained in that we have to use this current language but in our state constitutions, we can all be working to make the change that Nevada made. I love so, that. Okay, um, um, definitely look into Senator Pat Spearman. We had her come as part of Equality Utah. Um, they're one of our allies that we work with, with the Utah ERA Coalition. And she came and was our keynote speaker that is a, so cool. a couple of years ago. And I've just never, she's also come in and done a lot of advocacy work because she wants to see, you know, all the work she did in her state doesn't matter if we don't get more through. So That's she's cool. been awesome to come and speak. In particular, she was speaking about women in the military. On one of the discussion panels, Senator Spearman talked about a situation where she was sexually harassed by a superior in the military. Oh. And and so she knows that issue intimately, right? That That's really one of the signature issues of, of the ERA when I think about why we have to keep pushing is this idea of safety, right? We we know um, just the prevalence of sexual assault, sexual harassment. We know that until women are in the constitution, they are not safe. The low, the low numbers, when I look at Utah in particular, I, I don't know if I can share this with you or if you want it at a different point, but um, the Utah Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice estimated only 11.8% of women report sexual assault to law enforcement. And in Utah, rape is recorded at higher rates than the national average. Oh my gosh, in Utah? For example, oh state crime data shows that 1,500 rapes were reported in Utah law enforcement agencies last year. Records provided by state courts show just 273 cases were filed with a first degree felony rape charge. That's less than 6% are, oh my are, pro are prosecuted. Oh my gosh. It's horrifying. Okay, um, hang on, I can't remember where we left off. So I'm gonna just go back to the slides. Um, okay. <laughs> and go. Um, I think I talked about this. Okay, um, so in the, so another study for the LGBTQ parents is the Washington Post in 2014. It says children of same-sex couples fare better when it comes to physical health and social well-being than children in the general population, according to this researchers at the University in Melbourne, Australia. So that's really cool. Um, the American Soci um, Sociological Review in 2020, a study shows that the results indicate that the children raised by same-sex parents from birth perform better than children raised by different sex parents in both primary and secondary education. So they're that's doing better. Incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not shocked by this. Here's one... In, in my research and study in uh, communication studies, so I teach about, um, I teach interpersonal communication. The research indicates, right, that there is a higher level of empathy and, and that when same-sex same -sex couples face these challenges that, that other marriages don't, right? And, and so they have to be stronger in some ways. They have to push through some of these societal biases 
and they're dealing with them every day, right? You're dealing mm -hmm. with it every day. And yeah. so imagine being able to teach your children to empathize and to care for those around them. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised that they're excelling academically and socially. Yeah. I, it's just, a, a, I don't know if the word is impressed, like with the church's stance with all these, it's very, very clear with all these studies that, that there's no reason to be against gay marriage, but they still are. They're just, like you said, it's the patriarchy kind of stuff. It's patriarchy. Yeah. So another, <laughs> another study in the frontiers in psychology in 2021, it says that lesbian mothers were just as likely to have good mental health and positive relationships with their children as were heterose heterosexual mothers and that their children were no more likely to show emotional or, or behavioral difficulties, poor performance at school or atypical gender roles behavior than were children with heterosexual parents. So they're like, it's just as good. It is no more likely to show atypical gender roles behavior. Gender roles behavior I don't know. I feel it's like innate. They, that we're it's gonna... not socialized. It's yeah. exactly. It's exactly. It's innate. And like women can act like women all by themselves. You don't have. It's innate. It's it's in them. And also, you can't. You don't, us as a lesbian couple are not going to teach our seven year old right. Like she is herself. We are going to ensure that she has good self esteem, that she knows how to say no, that she knows the names of her body parts, and these are things that don't get taught in all religious societies. Mm -hmm. So there's that, but it has nothing to do with whether or not she's raised in a, a homosexual home. Yeah, with the gender roles are eternal. They seem to treat them as very fragile. Like if you if we allow the ERA to pass, women will wear pants, women will go to work, women will like they treat it like it's fragile. Like everyone will be confused on the what their roles are. It is so interesting. I um when you think about that idea, that one of the fears that that came out in the 1970s was that women would become men, that we were just dying, like you said, to throw on the pants and, <laughs> yeah. and to stomp around and be met, you know. Yes, more comfortable. <laughs> I mean, I, I have thrown on the pants. I'm not going to lie on that one. But I, I think what they really neglect is just this sense of, of seeing people for who they are, recognizing mm -hmm. that they have a funda fundamental right to equality. And we can, you know, in religious life, we can try to squish that down or we can embrace it, right? We can embrace it. And if, if they want religious organizations to, to thrive, to continue, to exist in the future, th there's got to be a shift in the way that we think about equality. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, so LGBTQ marriage is not protected in the Constitution right now. Uh, passing the ERA would cause strict scrutiny and women would find greater justice in courts. It will also help protect LGBTQ rights. Did you want to talk about this more? Yes, please. Because one of the arguments we we often hear is this idea that we have these laws in place and so we don't need the ERA anymore. Um, but if as soon as you go to court, as soon as you have a sexual harassment case and you try to take it to court, you suddenly realize, oh, wait, I'm not nearly as protected. It's often in these kind of plan B situations that we realize the limits of our own equality. So, for example, like with just traditional marriage, right, as soon as you are divorced, you suddenly you're like thrown into recognizing, oh, my goodness, they've reported that in traditional marriages, women's income in a divorce situation tends to go down by between 26 and 47 percent, like wow. immediate, immediately her income levels drop that amount in a divorce. I mean, when you when you start you know, when you start looking at this, so if you're in the plan A situation where you have this traditional marriage, you know, you're following sort of societal, societal ideas of what marriage should be. It's not until suddenly you, you're widowed or you're divorced or you're, you know, you, you come out as gay, right? You rec recognize things are different. Like that's when you start to recognize the limits of your own equality. Exactly. And and it becomes incredibly stark. Yeah, and I I think in the courts, the exciting part about the Equal Rights Amendment is that it would primarily impact us in the courts. So I was mentioning maybe I had an issue of sexual harassment or sexual abuse at work. I go to court and the courts uh, would have to, under the Equal Rights Amendment, look at my case and judge it using a higher standard. 
So right now, what they would use without the ERA is the 14th Amendment's Equality Clause. And that has been used thanks to the efforts of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who basically said, hey, we need some way to work around sexual um, discrimination cases. We've got to somehow be able to address women's rights. Um, let's use the 14th Amendment, right? So that, so, so through legislation that started to be used, but unfortunately, it's very inconsistently used. And so women can go take a case to court and, and because it's being judged right now at a lower legal standard, it's called reasonable scrutiny uh, or limited, limited scrutiny. Um, because of that, women often lose those cases. So under the Equal Rights Amendment, women would be seen as a protected class. So if you know who are the groups that the 14th Amendment were set to protect, religion, national origin, race, right? So women are not, not in there in, in the original writing of it. With strict scrutiny, a court will have to look at a woman's case and, and look at the merits of that case using a higher standard called strict scrutiny. Um, why does this matter? Well, there were a couple of landmark cases. One of them was Walmart versus Dukes. Okay, wait. Um, so there's Walmart versus Dukes. That was 2011. So it was the largest class action, action lawsuit. Yeah, they were getting paid lower. Um, and you said she essentially lost? Yes, she won, she won some aspects initially and then on appeal lost. And uh, Ms. Dukes found that she was not being paid as much as the other managers. She's a woman of color. And then she, come to find out there were 230 stores, Walmart stores, where the exact same thing was happening. And so they brought a class action suit to sue for comparable wages, pay equality. Was that, was that the biggest in U.S. history? Yes. Uh, it was? Okay. Yeah, it was. And so ultimately she won, but then it came back on, on appeal. And then she really essentially lost and not just lost, but all women lost because what they decided in this case was that every woman in those 230 stores that was discriminated against had to sue by herself. Uh, so she had to pay, she had to pay on her own. The other piece is that they required they basically said this was the case because they had not shown that Walmart had the intent to discriminate. So if you know about murder, if you watch CSI or murder mysteries, mm -hmm. like the hardest thing to prove is intent. Like what did that person intend? So in a courtroom, it's an incredibly high standard. Almost nobody can prove intent. And, and so requiring that kind of a standard, it would have had to be something like she had emails from, you know, 170 stores. She would have had to have brought like an email that they had sent out from the leadership at Walmart telling them not to pay women managers the same amount. So that would have been the, the level of evidence needed to prove intent to discriminate. And it's just, it was so, even the fact that it was happening at 230 stores wasn't enough for them. Ooh. So that kind of case though, then means that every other woman coming after her looking for pay equality has to do it on her own. She can't join a class action suit and the standard to prove her case is that much higher. Oh, that's awful. And they all need emails that say specifically, yeah, they the, will, will not pay you because you're a woman. Right. Yeah. The other case is the Lily Ledbetter case against Goodyear. That court case, she, she proved that she was being paid less in the same role as a man. And this is in 2006 and seven? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Lily Ledbetter found that she was consistently, as you as it says here, given low, lower rankings, lower raises, she found out that there was a substantial pay discrimination happening. And um, she sued them for discrimination. But what ultimately happened, so she was initially awarded 3.5 million, but then it was reduced. And what that did for women who came after her is it, they basically said that if you haven't discovered that you are being paid at a different level within 60 days of being hired, that 
your ability to be paid back is severely limited. Oh my gosh. In 60 Holy days. Cow. How many women know within 60 days that they're not being paid the same? Like often they don't know. even find out for <laughs> years. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's, uh... yeah. So that, well, these cases I think are great examples to use to show, hey, yes, we have laws in place to protect women at work, but look how they've been changed over time yeah. to the point oh where God. they are not protecting women and women yeah. are not winning. They are not getting justice in the courts. Yeah, the, the church in their in their pamphlet, they say, oh, women don't need the, we don't need the ERA because there's already so many laws that are in place. But like you said, look what happens. We, these, and most of those laws were passed in like 1974. And like, this was, this was 2007 and 2011. And there's more cases too. Like they don't, they don't work. Like, right. They, we yeah. have to understand that laws are meant to be changed, right? We are, we're gearing up for our legislative session that starts in January, 45 days of just terror for us as we think about the kinds of things that are going to happen in our legislature. But, um, but you know, that, their their duty and their role in that legislative session is to rework laws, to build on other laws, to shift and change laws. So we think of laws as being this permanent thing, and we're having to really rethink that. We have to recognize how impermanent they are, how quickly they can be shifted, how quickly those rights that have been so hard won can be walked back. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that happen across the country, right? And and Roe is probably your best example of that, right? I think there were so many people who thought that will never be overturned. They they just couldn't imagine that 50 years of legal precedent could be overturned like it was. And and look where we are right now. It's just that um, in order for real protection to happen, women have to be in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a slide on this one about how men are in the Constitution and how men have used that to prove that the male draft into the military oh, yeah. is an unconstitutional. Yeah. Okay. So that's the next thing we're going to talk about is the military mm -hmm. service. And so this is a, this was a big concern in the in the seventies, and the church does talk about this. Do you want to read this section? Okay. They ask, what would be the ERA's impact on military service for women? ERA proponents concede that its passage would impose upon women the same draft requirements as men and the further probability of comparable combat duty with the particular hazards that poses for women. So we don't need the ERA because women will have to go to war. Um, and so, but yes, you said, um, which I mean, which negates so many things. One is that it, us having another draft is incredibly unlikely. We, we have a volunteer military service now. It's all volunteer. The other piece is that we wage war so differently now. We don't put, you know, we're we're often not on the front lines of a situation. We're in a hotel room with a drone, right? Like we, it, it just negates kind of the progress we've made. And also the realization that women are in every arm of our armed forces. And mm -hmm. where they are in service, they deserve to be protected. Exactly. Like women are already there. We need to protect them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and this, this male only draft is a fascinating situation because in 2019 in a Texas federal court, they found that the male only draft was unconstitutional. And so they suggested to the selective service that would be in charge of a draft, hey, you need to make these changes. But their argument was essentially saying because men men's rights are protected in the constitution. That's what they used as the basis for their wow. legal argument. The important thing to realize is that women could not make the same argument. So if for an example, you felt like women shouldn't be drafted, you would not be able to use women's standing in the constitution to make your argument because we are not protected in the constitution. That, that's oh, so telling, that's so like crazy. That. Yeah, holy cow. And I think, you know, when we think about military service, think about someone you know that serves. I, I had a young woman in my neighborhood who I worked with who serves currently in the military. And, and I, I want her to be protected. I want to, her to know that she is not going to face sexual abuse, sexual harassment. I want her to be able to advance in her career as high as she wants to go. 
and and not have these barriers right to what she mm-hmm. to how she wants to serve our country and yeah. I, I think it's so ironic that that the church and our legislators here will often be like I just can't fathom the idea of my daughter serving in the war but they're fine with their sons <laughs> mm, yeah like why do you love and <laughs> your daughters more than your sons that's not yeah. No, I think it's so important to recognize, too, in terms of sexual assault in the military, we have had a couple of years of really understanding the extent of that sexual assault. And um, in particular, if you remember the Vanessa Golan um, situation where she was murdered at Fort Hood in April of 2020, um, and it really, it her death was really the catalyst. Just looking to see how it was mishandled was such a catalyst for us understanding the extent of of assault, she was raped and murdered. Um, But what happened from that, for months, activist politicians and Specialist Golan's family called for an investigation into Fort Hood, the nation's third largest army base. On July 10th, 2020, Ryan D. McCarthy, the Secretary of the Army, ordered an investigation into Fort Hood's command culture after a year of violent deaths, suicides and complaints of sexual harassment on the military base. As a result of the report on investigations findings released on December 8th of 2020, 14 army officials at Fort Hood were either fired or suspended, including several high ranking leaders. The investigation found major flaws at Fort Hood and a command climate that was permissive of sexual harassment and sexual assault. So that's a report from the New York Times, what to know about the death of Vanessa Golan. And it it just, her case really, I think hit our consciousness in a powerful way to recognize that women in our military and men and some men are being assaulted at these high rates. There's not a great rate of of coming forward about these because there's a culture of keeping people quiet and that you won't advance if you come forward with with your sexual assault. Um, and so there's this culture of silence that is really hurting those who serve in the military. And it's also a pervasive way to keep women from advancing in their career in the military. So when we think about how the Equal Rights Amendment would impact women, it really would help them in all of the spaces where they are, right? It's going to help them at home, right? We know here in Utah, we have massively high domestic violence rates, higher than in the national average, one in three women. Wow. Um, We know it would help women at home. We know it would help women at school. We had a case, I don't know if you know the case of Lauren McCluskey, who was murdered on campus four years ago at the University of U. Yeah. I was there. I worked there when that happened. I worked there when that happened. It was just horrifying just horrifying because they had the information, the campus police had the information, Knew. The, the regular police in Salt Lake City had the information. Oh I'm um, just God. the mishandling of that case alone, just, just unbelievable. So when we think about protecting our students on campus, protecting folks in the military, all the spaces, right? All of the spaces where um, that women occupy in particular, let's protect women in our constitutions so they can be protected in all of these spaces. Um, Umbrella, let's just start from the top and protect them all the way across to everything. Yeah, holy cow. So that a a constitutional amendment cannot be changed. It's, um, it, it, I mean, there can be slight amendments made to it, but generally speaking, it has the cement, it has the gravitas it can't be walked back to stay. It can't yeah. be walked back like our laws can be. Right, right. Yeah, so these are just like talking about the military sexual assault in the military. There's there was two. This is military.com talks about these. Um, it says that in 2021 it spiked the highest level, these these um the assault assault numbers. And then it says about 8.4% of female troops and 1.5% of male troops said they were assaulted while on duty. And then later it says 6.8% of women were estimated to have been assaulted. And then it talks about it even more. Um, 35,000 service members' lives and careers were irrevocably changed by these crimes. Having equal rights will help us in every way. And then from the New York Times, it gives uh, some more numbers as well. It says 16.5% of the armed services 
they, the women make up 6.5% of the armed forces. And this has yet nearly one in four service women reports experiencing sexual assault in the military. And like you said, that number is low because a lot of women, or this number is not accurate because a lot of women don't come forward. Uh, one key reason for troops who are assaulted rarely see justice is the way in which these crimes are investigated and prosecuted. So like, the, again, the equal rights can only help all of these matters. Yeah, and you saw with that Fort Hood example, how they, you know, all of these, all of these people at the top were implicated. And so it wasn't just one or two people that failed Vanessa Golan. They found at least 14 that failed to help protect her. Holy cow. Well, and it's a, a boys club, you know, where they protect each other. Like um, they're just covering each other's backs. And, and the people who are going to suffer from that are the women because they're not covered by that. Okay, I just wanted to show it on the big screen. So nearly one in four service, service women report sexual assault in the military. And then it says more than half reporting experiencing harassment. So like, so half are harassed and then 25%, a, a quarter are reported sexual assault. More than half are right. being harassed, more which is half, basically yeah. everybody. Um, I would just say, too, that we have to recognize that this issue of sexual assault and sexual harassment is happening in our states as well, right? Like Utah, just, yeah, to, give you a, very, yeah. just to give you a sense of how things stand here in my state in Utah, um, the Utah Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice has estimated that only 11.8% of women report sexual assault to law enforcement. And in Utah, rape is recorded at higher rates than the national average. So Still, awful. only a fraction of them are actually prosecuted. For example, state crime data shows 1,500 rapes were reported in Utah law enforcement agencies last year. Records provided by state courts show just 273 cases were filed with a first-degree felony rape charge. And that doesn't even count those that maybe, you know, were uh, didn't actually go all the way through the process, right? Those were just the cases that were filed, 273 out of 1,500. Holy cow. So we average, um, and I, I work with some amazing people here in Utah. I know you may know Kate Kelly, who's very actively involved in the ERA effort on the national level. She's working with legislators right now on the ERA. She's a constitutional attorney. Her mom is also an attorney. Her name is Donna Kelly. And she was a sexual assault prosecutor for 30 years in Salt Lake City. And she works with me on my, on my committee with the Utah ERA Coalition. And she talks about this percentage, less than 6% that are actually prosecuted. Oh, my God. So, and that doesn't even tell you the ones that are actually find justice, right? Those are just the ones that actually go to trial, which is an abysmal rate. It's abysmal. Yeah. Okay. So the net, so this church also tries to show is showing that the passing the ERA will have negative effects on the family. Um, do you want to read this one? So they ask, how would the ERA affect the family? The ERA could make it more difficult for wives and mothers to remain at home because it could require the removal of legal requirements that make a husband responsible for the support of his wife and children. It could place an added tax burden on the single income family in order to attain social security benefits for the wife. And it could pose the threat of compulsory military service, even for married women. So these are old arguments. I just want to direct you back to the 1970s where these arguments came from and they have each been debunked. So in, in our family courts, we use a standard called the best interest of the child now. And here in Utah, our entire legal code has been shifted to be gender neutral. So it, it really is on a case by case basis, like who in the partnership is making more money, right? And then even in that case, if, if uh, one of the partners isn't making as much, they have a certain number of years to start being able to support themselves. So we're just not seeing the courts fall along these traditional gender uh, roles any longer. They literally are looking at best interest of the child and they're looking at it from a much more gender neutral stance. So I really, I think so much of that is fear, language, fear, rhetoric, to get us worried about social security. That's just not how social security is figured. So yeah. we, we absolutely, I think it's also kind of demeaning to men to suggest that we need to force them 
to live up to their responsibilities. Like when we're equal partners, we're equally invested in the well-being of our family. And that might come about in different ways, right? But like, for instance, in my own family, my husband is such an amazing nurturer. And, and all, you know, our entire life, we were taught, well, women nurture, women, you know, this is your role. This is um, how you're meant to show up in the marriage. But how sad for my husband if he felt that he couldn't show up in a compassionate and loving way, nurturing way for my kids. I, I think it's so demeaning of men, right, to suggest that they can't be um, yeah. loving and a loving and important part of families in that way. And that they're just sort of involved in this financial transaction in the family. Yeah. Right. And again, it's the eternal gender roles where it's like the men are supposed to provide and preside and protect. But if it's not in our law, then they're not going to do it. Like it's it's eternal, but it's um, not, I don't know. You, but you have to make it mandatory right. by rule or they won't do it. Right. Like, not, uh, yeah. It's so demeaning. And I, you know, our young people do not resonate with that idea at all. Like they just, they absolutely see past that. I, um, I think, you know, whenever we can remind people that families look every kind of way, like a family has come together in so many different iterations and, you know, to, to just settle on one picture, one, one style and say, this is family is so diminutive, right? Like we just, yeah. in my own family, you know, I have, um, I, my parents had eight kids, but then they divorced and then they each got remarried and then one got remarried again. And like when I, when I kind of piece together what family looks like to me, it, it's such a different picture than I think what the LDS church is, is kind of putting forward in their propaganda, right? It right. just, it's not, it, it's not honoring the families that we are currently living in, which yeah, the reality. are yeah. same gender families, which are, um, you know, mixed, mixed orientation families. Um, you know, we have to be willing to look at, at all of the ways that families are made up. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because uh, I came from a divorced family as well. And I remember asking her bishop because uh, my mom got remarried and we thought that she was going to get married in the temple and that we would have to choose whether or not to be sealed to our stepdad and my mom or to be sealed to my dad. And I was like, well, that's that's awfully unfair to make me choose between my parents and like but like, they don't have a way to work around that. They're like, you just yeah. have to pick one. You just have to, because because if they weren't sealed in the temple before that, then you're screwed, basically. And uh, like, I've never gotten over that. Like, I no, just it, it's really cool. Yeah. For, a, for an organization that says it's for the family, I mean, let's show that. If that's- Instead of well, dividing if, families. Yeah, if you want to say that you're good for families, you've got to show that you're good for families. And yeah. I, you know, one of the things you mentioned there was about like kind of this idea of who's sealed to who. And it just, it made me immediately think of polygamy because mm -hmm. my mom, you know, she had gotten official um, temple divorce and, but her husband had been married three times prior. And the last thing that she said to him on his, when he was dying of a heart attack was about like, I know I'm not your first wife. Um, but up there, I'll be your last. Like, it, I mean, the last thing she was thinking about Aww. when her husband is dying in front of her is like her order in the polygamy picture. Like it just is so, um, when we think about organizations and particularly religious organizations and how they can increase equality, I would call on the LDS church to remove section 132 immediately exactly. from your doctrine, from the doctrine and covenants, remove that, uh, that doctrine. I would refer folks to read Carolyn Pearson's book. If yeah. you haven't read the ghost of eternal polygamy, um, to understand the real impact that this has on women, on their psyche, right. On this understanding of like that, the person that they belong to on this earth might not be the person that they can be with ultimately. It's it's a very sad picture of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. When we consider that for women in particular, it can mean this idea of like, 
having eternal, you know, spirit children eternally and having, you know, being one of many wives for, yeah. for basically uh, incubator for the rest of eternity. <laughs> yeah. That's not, yeah. It's not a, it's not a heaven that is very appealing for women. Yeah. So we've got to really reshift our thinking on some of these policies and recognize that as terrible as polygamy was for women in the early church life, right? There was incredible neglect. We know we've read their stories and know just the neglect, the financial hardship that happened um, as they were often left to their own devices to try and support their their children from that marriage. Yeah. Um, if they weren't the preferred wife, right? They they were demeaned. They were um, they were harmed, right? They were traumatically harmed by polygamy and early in early religious life. But I, I just, I believe Carolyn's book and, and her, the experience of women show the trauma that women now currently in the LDS church are suffering as they consider um, that they are likely to be one of many spiritual wives in the hereafter. Yeah. Um, and what that means for them in terms of marriage, remarriage, who they're sealed to, who they're spiritually divorced from, like where the children and where do the children go and all of that? Yeah. Like how do we connect families? If we're for families, let's really show that we're for families. And yeah. I think too, this connects a little bit with the ERA discussion in terms of economics, right? Like the reason that young people, this idea of like the traditional husband works, wife stays home, to raises the children, why that doesn't work is because we are living in an economic reality that doesn't allow for that. It doesn't align. It yeah. doesn't align. So those are generational ideas that are so outdated. They're outdated mm -hmm. and they don't resonate right now because they don't reflect the time that we're living in. So how great if you are privileged enough to be able to live that plan A lifestyle, right? That um, husband works, wife stays home, but that is a thing really of the past. Like financially, we just to be able to afford a mortgage, just be able to keep your kids clothed and active and happy and fed, like those kinds of things don't happen without both parents being financially involved. And right. what this means for women is that women, so in Utah, when Utah women work more than women on the national average. Wow. Really? People are surprised to hear that, but they work part time. So uh -huh. they are juggling family life, right? And a second job, which, what do we know about part time work? No benefits, yeah. no mm -hmm. upward mobility, mm -hmm. and really not a livable wage. And the right. schedules are always all over the place. Mm -hmm. right. So that is the economic reality, at least for Utah women right now. And, and, when when you try to understand like the housing market and just the way that our our wages have not kept up with with um inflation you just you know that as beautiful a dream as that was in the 1950s those days are over and yeah. we have to be willing and courageous enough to look into the future and say how do we build an equal future for our kids you know when i hear these arguments from older men i think you have granddaughters, you have grandsons, what do you want for them? You know, what do you, what kind of a future could you envision for them um, with all of these economic aspects, right? Um, we won't have a strong family unit unless we're equal partners. Well, and I want to add one more thing to that. So um, let's say that Julia and I are married and we have our our seven-year-old and the Mormon missionaries knock on our door and say, we would love to convert you to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're like, we would love to be part of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Bring it on. And they say, okay, but you guys have to break up first. Like they, when they say they love families, they're in the business of a specific kind of family and they would have to break up our family in order for us to fit in to this ideal. So they're, they're not actually in also, um, keeping families separated in many other ways. Like we couldn't go to, um, our siblings, uh, wedding in the temple just this last weekend. Yeah. We had to sit outside of two of my siblings got married, but we couldn't go. And then, or even like with, uh, with the ceilings, um, uh, like my daughter is understanding or learning that in heaven, her dad, 
um, she'll be sealed to her dad, but not to me because I've been excommunicated from the church. And that, that her her heavenly mother or her, like he'll he'll get married eventually. And then that woman will be her mother in heaven. And so it's like, it's, it's uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the church is not in the business of. Um, it seems more families. like that they are in the business of frightening us into doing what they want and using our families as hostage. Yeah. Like, because if we don't do what they want, then we we won't be with our family together. Yes. But so most it of seems like it seems like a hopeful message. This idea of the plan of mm -hmm. salvation, right? Uh -huh. It's such a hopeful message. Families could be together forever, but it comes with all of these exclusions. So it's just like yeah. you said. It's like uh, that saying about no empty chairs, right? My brother in Texas, he his family would always say that. Like they would repeat that, like kind of as a mantra at their house. Mm -hmm. And it just, it ends up, when you look at it from the, the flip side of it, it, it's really a fear message of like that you, there's not a place for you. So as yeah. much as the LDS church right now is saying, there's a place for gay members, come, we'll welcome you, right? There's this, all of this kind, saccharine, sweet kind of a, an approach of like, yes, we, we will love and welcome you. The reality is that like here, here in Utah, as you described, we know of many gay couples who have been excommunicated, just a whole slew of them recently, quietly wanting to kind of keep it quiet. So on the one hand, we're welcoming you in. On the other hand, we are severing you spiritually, which is so traumatic, from a religion that you would want to be part of. Um, it just doesn't square. And like I said, you know, these step backs that we're making, we're making these massive step backs, they won't last. They can't last. The momentum is very much on a more equal future. And I know as someone who works with young people on a regular basis, I'm so fortunate. I, I know that our young people will not settle for anything less than an equal future. Yeah, I love that. Um, so, the, so there's another slide on the, um, they're talking more about the, going back to the church's stance. Eliminate legal responsibility. An additional danger is that instead of merely changing laws to give a wife the same responsibilities as her husband for financial support, passage of the ERA could eliminate all legal responsibility for both spouses. A brief and supportive ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, prepared for the League of Women Voters by the New York law firm Bellamy Blank, Goodman, Kelly, Ross, and Stanley states, legislatures will have to redefine the obligation of support between husband and wife. Criminal laws which make a husband liable for the support of his wife should probably be repealed rather than extended to cover women. Let's see. This is a this is a false flag. It's just uh, those those efforts to make family courts more gender neutral are long term, right? Here in Utah, that effort started in the 1970s, and I think this is like a fear message again, trying to suggest that men are just going to abandon their families if we don't strictly spell it out, or if yeah. the woman is wake, making more than the man. Then, um, then she wouldn't be responsible for her family. It just seems outrageous to me. And again, very demeaning um, mm. that men and women w can't be expected to uh, take care of their family responsibilities without it being strictly spelled out in law. Yeah. Those laws will exist. They're trying to suggest that those, that all rule of law will just disappear, right, with the ERA. Yeah. Just just, the window. It's really ridiculous. It um, is, yeah. That's Absolutely. not the case. In fact, we know that when both partners are invested financially, emotionally, that our families are stronger. The Equal Rights Amendment is for families. Yes. yes. All families. So, and then another is the they talk about the erosion of parental responsibilities, which is very similar to what we just talked about. Um, so they said that the, the negative impact of the ERA um, could have on present laws protecting mothers and children from fathers who do not accept legal responsibilities for their children. So again, sort of the same thing, where if we don't spell it out in law, the, the dads are not going to support wife and children, and which is just silly. And yeah, yeah that's not... I reject that argument. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, you know, you'll always have maybe some parents who aren't going to follow up to their responsibilities. But by and large, you know, when we take on that um that role you know it's it's a lifetime thing and the courts are not going to just say because of the era we're not going to protect families that's just not that's not going to happen yeah well and if you 
if you're choosing to have a family, you're going to choose to take care of them rather than being forced into having a child that you don't want. It'll be harder for you. Like giving people choices and rights is better for everyone. The children will be more taken care of by parents who chose to have them. Like across the board, it's, it's better. Yeah. Yes. I can't. When, how long is it going to take us to expand our idea of what a family is? Like, can we just get there already? I mean, we are yeah. living, we are living the realities of families that look all kinds of ways. We don't mm-hmm. have to minimize what we consider to be a family. Instead, instead, in this day and age, in 2023, we have to be willing to look and see all of the beautiful ways that families are made, right? Sometimes it's grandparents raising grandchildren. Sometimes, you know, for me, I, my mom was a single mom. Uh, which is amazing, right? And and she faced so many challenges and difficulties as a single mom. We were, you know, for a few years, pretty food insecure. And until the divorce was finalized, it took three years really for that to be finalized. And we really struggled in that amount of time, right? She she came out of this marriage relationship that the church would uphold and and really was not protected, right? So what was in place for her wasn't protective, right? And those those responsibilities weren't adhered to. And she was really left to flounder without kind of the recent work experience that would have made getting a job much easier. I think she, her first job was working at like a print shop. And, you know, as someone who hadn't been working in technology or anything, she really struggled in that job. It was like kind of a nightmare. She'd describe all the things that would go wrong when she'd get home at the end of the day. But like we struggled just to make rent and just to have groceries at that time period. And we were really, we had to reach out and rely on the church, right? We had to, our, um, we lived about three blocks from my father's home and we, but we were in a different stake and that, that word Bishop is the one who helped us make our rent each month. So just like when we're talking about, do we want independence? Do we want folks to have to be reliant? Do you know, do we want financial accountability? Let's empower men and women, right, to be able to be financially independent. And, mm-hmm. and that's really what, that's the reality so many of us are living in. If you know a single mother, give her a really big hug. <laughs> I mean, it is so much, it's so much hard work, right? And the, my mom having paid into many of these church programs, over the years, then, you know, really struggled initially to get the help that she needed. And I think that's, that policy is still true today, right? We have, um, when you go and ask for support and help, you have, you're met with a list of requirements instead of someone being compassionate and kind and saying, oh my goodness, how can we help you? You have paid your tithing for X amount of years. You've paid fast offerings for how many years? Like, how can we help you? It's your turn. You know, it's your turn. So women, you know, in those situations often find themselves just really at the mercy of of others and, you know, scrambling to try to be independent and responsible. So if we're invested in making families stronger, all the different iterations of families that exist, um, equality is the road we have to travel. That's the road. Yeah. And I think that um, all all of the things that you just said, equality for all, uh, all types of families, I think that that's something that Jesus would approve of. Absolutely. I think. I don't know. That sounds like something that he would like. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we know he loved to hang out with the marginalized folks. Yes. Yes. There's proof of that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So another issue that the church talks about in their pamphlet is the eroding of the constitutional division of power. Do you want to read this? The ERA would also further shift lawmaking power from elected legislators to non-elected judges. It would accelerate the trend to govern by judicial decisions rather than by passage of law. Placing more power with the courts further erodes the separation of powers protective shield surrounding our freedoms. If the ERA is ratified, the federal judiciary will be required to interpret the broad language of the amendment to give new specific legal definitions to its sweeping provisions. 
I, there is so much in there that I can't support. <laughs> um, where do I start? One, if the ERA is ratified, it's already been ratified. 38 states have ratified already. So it should say if the ERA is certified. So mm -hmm. all we're waiting on right now is a signature of the archivist to sign the ERA into law. Um, as a constitutional amendment, they are incredibly rare. We don't like to make them. We only ever make a constitutional amendment if something is so serious and affects so much of the country. So you can look at sex discrimination and see that historically, as well as currently, it's such an important issue. And so absolutely, there is a legal necessity for this to happen, or it never would have passed both houses of Congress. Yeah, well, it's um, over half of the population yeah. and like they affect the other half of the population. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, again, it's this sort of fear language that if we ratify, if we, sorry, certify the Equal Rights Amendment, if we put women explicitly in the Constitution, that it's going to shake our constitutional law. I just, I just don't, I don't understand that. Yeah, I don't, yeah. It's, it's such a, fund, a fundamental foundational principle that women should be protected in our constitution. It's our founding document. It's, it really, it's amazing to me that women were not in it from the beginning. Um, I, as, as you look at the, um, John Adams, as he was headed off to the Constitutional Convention, right? He got a letter from his wife. She wrote him a letter saying, remember the ladies. And she said, please remember us in this constitution. He wrote her back a letter. It's a fascinating letter to read because it essentially says, no, I can't do that. And no, he did not do that, right? So we know that at that time period when our constitutional was written, which is which <clears throat> these constitutional purists just make me laugh because uh, if you support any kind of equality, like we, we have to acknowledge the importance of these amendments, right? In making our constitution stronger. And the constitutional purists would want us to just take away all of the amendments and stick with the original wording, which left so many people out. It left out women explicitly. It left out people of color explicitly. We were considered property. We could be bartered and and um, and married away, and it was based on property, right? We were considered yeah. property. And so when the Constitution was written, that's how we thought about women. Can we not move beyond that very yeah. base understanding of, of the importance of protecting every human, right, under the law? Like, mm -hmm. for me, how in the world can we say that we are a progressive country, that we are a true democracy, that we um, value the rights of others if we are not explicitly stating and giving that protection in our own founding document? Yes. And like, there's this huge irony too, that when, we, when we're working with other countries to get them their own constitutions and democratize in other parts of the world, we require them to have an equality clause. We require wow. them to have basically an equal rights amendment, but we don't have one of our own. Yeah. Well, it's that's so, it's really critical. <laughs> yeah, it's it is very critical. Okay, so um, so I just want to talk about the Fourteenth Amendment again, and just because it's not it's not good enough. So the Fourteenth Amendment in, in essence says, "No state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property." without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So it's just, yeah, these can't be denied to any person. And then, um, do you wanna talk about this? Justice Scalia famously said, we know that the constitution does not encourage discrimination on the basis of sex, neither does it protect against it. So he acknowledged right there that the 14th amendment was never really meant to cover sex discrimination. And, um, and so even though at times it has been interpreted and used that way, it hasn't been consistent enough to really provide justice. And, yeah. and that's why having the 14th Amendment is so important. But again, it, it was really built around race, national origin, and religion. And then women were, it kind of was used as a workaround. So 
if we, it is not an explicit protection against sex discrimination. And one of our most conservative justices, <laughs> Scalia, so Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg were buddies. They used to go to the opera together, like on, you know, on the court, they butted heads and saw things very differently. But in private, they were actually friends, which I think is, I don't know how that, I don't know how that worked <laughs> personally, but um, I do think they tried to respect each other's difference of opinion here. But I just, when it comes to my personal equality, that's not a for debate, right? That's, that's not like just a disagreement that we can have that I deserve basic protection in my own constitution. Agreed. Yeah. Talking about this 14th Amendment and how it was a workaround, can you tell us more about the Belva Lockwood versus the U.S. court? Well, so often you'll see the situation where women who were the first at something were denied the ability to access. Um, and particularly that happened in terms of education. And so that really was the impetus for women receiving the right to vote, but then also the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so I believe Alice Paul went on to gain probably two legal degrees. Um, Crystal Eastman had several legal degrees, but they were some of the first women in their class to, to uh, be able to access that kind of education, that level of education. Um, if here in our own state, it's kind of an interesting story um, that uh, Martha Hughes Cannon ran for office against her husband. Oh, I uh, they did kind of a ranked choice voting back then. And so it wasn't like head to head against him. It was more just like she was higher on the list uh, when all things came down. But she became the first woman elected to state Senate. Hmm. And she was sent by Brigham Young to become a doctor. Okay, so to medical school. So she was sent out to the East Coast, one of the first women and she describes a similar situation to Belle Lockwood here, where um, she would be singled out, like there would be like a chair not left for her, like she would be accused of distracting the men who were there for serious reasons. And here she was, you know, trying to learn, earn a medical degree. Like eventually she came back to Utah and she was a doctor. She was actually a doctor and delivered many of our polygamous babies here. <laughs> And she was, when polygamy was um, outlawed, she uh, was called, they actually sent her out of the country so that she could not testify in the court cases against the polygamous men. Oh my gosh. Because she was present and had delivered <laughs> many of their babies. Oh my gosh. She was also a polygamous wife, right? And because of her essentially being um, you know, being relegated to, you know, sent out of country to avoid prosecution, she had to fend for herself. She had to raise her daughter by herself with no financial means, no way to support herself. Um, after everything that she had done here to help establish the hospital of Deseret, the very first hospital, training doctors and nurses, like essentially setting up our medical community here in Utah. After all of that, she's then sent away she struggled so hard. She ultimately left polygamy and went to the West Coast. Yeah, she left. With a, you know, when we talk about her here in our state, we don't talk about the fact that she left. <laughs> we don't mention that. But she really realized how detrimental polygamy was for women, and she felt it so severely. The exciting part is that so every state is allowed two statues in the Hall of Statues in Congress. Guess who one of our statues is? Can you guess? Brigham Young. Brigham, Martha Hughes. Hughes. Brigham Young. Brigham Young. And so, and it was Philo T. Farnsworth was the other one who invented the, the TV television. Guy? Oh, yeah. Brigham Young. The television. Yeah. Um, he has now, based on some legislation that was started by a Girl Scout troop here in my, my city, North Salt Lake, uh, they worked with Becky Edwards, who just ran for Congress. She lost, sadly, but had a great showing um, against Mike Lee. Um, she, um, she worked with this Girl Scout troop to get passed in our legislature to send a statue of Martha to replace Philo. And so uh -huh. she is, with COVID, it got delayed, but there's going to be a great unveiling that you should look for, for Martha 
Martha Hughes Cannon, who I for me is such a powerhouse when I think about what she was able to accomplish. But look at the barriers, right, for her to even get her education. And that was with the support of LDS leadership, right? She still struggled in that time period. Just women were not, did not have the access to education. So in this case, she was it correct in saying that she was deemed not a person and she could not get her degree? Right. So like that idea of personhood, imagine. Yeah, just so awful. Would be, I would be so mad. You know, I don't feel that much different in 2023 when it comes to my bodily autonomy. I don't feel like a person, right? I don't feel like the yeah. law looks at me as a person if I have to invite my legislator legislators into my my OB office, right? Yeah, yeah. And I it is that sense of being less than a less than a person. These are rights that men have. <laughs> men do not have to ask to have a medical procedure. They do not, they did not have to suffer these barriers. And that's why her case, I think, is so important because when we when we talk about elevating women to a protected class, like race, religion, national origin, we don't do that for no reason. We do it because there's a historical record of discrimination that goes all the way back. Yes. So when we raise them to that standard in court, it's because they've earned that. They've had to overcome all of these barriers. And so when a case comes before the courts and they use strict scrutiny, they are not required to prove intent. They are not required to use that same standard that we've been using, that intermediate, intermediate scrutiny standard. They will use this higher standard and women will win these cases. They will more often get justice. And um, know that. we need that. We need that so much in our courts. Yeah. I did not realize it would make that much of a difference. Yeah. Wow. Currently, it is currently happening that doctors will deny women the ability to have their tubes tied or have a hysterectomy if they decide, no, I'd like to make this decision now. They can tell them, um, I'm actually going to need you to have your husband sign off on that. And if they're not married, oh, well, let's just wait until you're married because your husband might want babies. And like, oh, um, your husband's currently okay with it. Well, you might get divorced and your future husband might want. Yeah. What, what is that? Yeah. It's unbelievable in 2023 that we still have to get our husband's permission to have our tubes tied. That's yeah. our it's just own body. Is it yeah. the case? Is it the case with men? No. Have you oh, seen yeah. the mastectomy process? It is so easy. It is fast. It is over without any kind of discussion. And wow. to me, that's just so unbelievable because those those situations are the same situation. I don't want to procreate from here on. And yeah. yet the process is so different for women and men. It makes me angry. <laughs> yeah. And so maybe I think I've got this correct, but it wasn't until 1974 when the Equal, Equal Credit Opportunity Act passed and that women in the U.S. were granted the right to own a bank account on their own. Yeah. Is that is that amazing yeah, to so you? Crazy. Like this is in my lifetime. <laughs> I know you're a little bit younger than yeah. me. But this is, I was born in 70. Like my mom hadn't even graduated from high school yet. <laughs> yeah. I Wait, mean, say that again? Just, it's unbelievable because it seems, it sounds like something that, you know, you just assume it would have been like the 1940s or the 1950s. You know, it just, it seems crazy that it was just 1974. It was a relative right. reason that right. and then, like, women that, have that control over their own finances. Right. And then like the, you said the rise was in 1972 of the ERA this is during that. So it's like, maybe this is a response in part to these women saying we don't have equal rights. We can't even open a bank account. And they're like, okay, well, we'll let you open the bank account. I'm like, no, that yeah. momentum, there's no question that, that the Equal Rights Amendment inspired many of these changes, right? Like if we can't get it passed across the board, which is what it should be, then we're at least going to take and start doing things incrementally. We did that here in our state with Supreme Court Justice Christine Durham. She was the first Supreme woman Supreme Court Justice here in Utah. She uh, was part of that movement to ratify in Utah that was unsuccessful. There were two in 1973 and one in 1977. And when it didn't pass, she said at least she was able to negotiate 
to go through the Utah state code, the legal code, and make it gender neutral. So again, it was like women saying, if we can't have the whole package, then let's like at least pick off this thing, this thing, you know, what can we, what can we have impact on? And there's no question that these movements helped inform the others. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you hear about this with, uh, I don't know if any of you watched Mrs. America, the Netflix movie. (laughs) It's an amazing series, but Gloria Steinem was a little pissed (laughs) in that series she said there's a huge piece of misinformation that she thought people should know like so much of it was true and accurate um and overall i think she really appreciated it but she said the reason that the equal rights amendment did not pass within that seven year time frame was that insurance companies realized that they were going to have to pay women equal to men And so financially, they started to do a movement against kind of an underground but pervasive movement against the Equal Rights Amendment. So when we think about why it was stopped, it wasn't because, I mean, as much as Mormon women getting on buses and voting at conventions was horrific and horrible, right, um, to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment, as, as terrible as it is to realize that you're your religious organization was calling women to go door to door to tell people not women not to vote again for their own rights, just as they did with the Prop 8, where they had they called people, they they got into their databases about who who donated the most amount of money. And then they asked those people to donate to the Prop 8 efforts. They That exact template that they used for Prop 8, they used for the Equal Rights Amendment to stop it. And I, and then so I, I, wanted to ask, I don't know this, but in the booklet, it says that the, they said, is tithing money used to, to against the, equal, the church's push against equal rights? And they're like, no, no tithing was used. No, but no, like, no, no. What it says is, was money given to groups okay, yes. to, fight, to fight against the ERA? So they worded, money, no, right? they worded it very carefully. Yeah. Money was given to groups to stop the ERA. Women were called as a church calling to go and speak out against the ERA. The church paid to bus oh women to a convention, the, the International Year of the Women Convention, to vote no on every aspect of women's rights. Uh, when you when you look at what the, the church created a committee compl- just dedicated to stopping the ERA. And some of our some of our more recent prophets were part of that committee as young men. Uh, Thomas S. Monson, oh, uh, Hink, Hinkley. So some of these folks were part of that early committee to stop women's rights. And just as a woman, as you know, as a woman in this religious life, I just can't fathom that that a a God would sanction that half more than half of the population doesn't deserve equal rights. Like I just I can't fathom that. Like there's no sense for me if if God exists if a if it's energy in the universe, however you choose to think of sort of that higher power, like how in the world could a higher power look at a man and a woman and believe that they one was superior or substandard to the other? Like it just, to me, gender, we have not even yet begun to understand what gender is like on a spiritual level. Like we don't have we don't have the scholarship yet. We're getting the scholarship, but we we don't have the scholarship. We definitely don't have the leadership. We don't have the understanding yet to really to really have processed and thought about the way that a god or or a higher power looks at gender. Like, but we do know that everyone is great in the sight of God. We know that. We've been taught that. Um, we've been we've sung the songs right we've sung i am a child of god we um we've sung carolyn pearson's song i'll walk with you right i'll talk with you even if you're different um i will be there for you we we literally are taught so many things in our religious orientation that point to the worth of souls being great in the sight of god and and for me that informs the work that i do 
Um, it informs the mission towards greater equality. I know that this is what is right for me to be doing. And so much of my religious upbringing was focused on that idea of like, if, if it's speaking to you, then you need to go and do that work. And um, we have actually recently reached out to the LDS Church to ask for a sit down meeting. They did meet with our, our, our group. It was actually a group with Arizona um, when they were working to ratify as well. A couple of years ago, 2018. At that time, they told us that they would remain quiet on the Equal Rights Amendment, that they would say no comment when asked by Borderline. That changed the day that Karen Kwan announced her bill to ratify in 2018. That morning, they changed their stance. The night before, they put out through the Desert News uh, editorial board, they put out a hit piece on the Equal Rights Amendment um, that was unsigned essentially, but from the editorial board um, using that platform to strike down this idea of equality. You know, Karen is an amazing LDS woman. She's the first Chinese American to be in our legislature. Wow. Uh, she is the kindest, she's a sociology professor where I work. She's amazing. Like, um, and she's just become a state senator. So she was in the House of Representatives before then. Um, you will never find a kinder person and her whole mission in bringing that bill forward was in reiterating that idea of like, we are all valued in the sight of God, absolutely. And we all deserve that fundamental equality. And so um, for, for that reaction from the church, like they literally took over the headlines the next day with the LDS church reiterates their non-support basically the ERA like rather than it being you know we had planned in months in advance for this big announcement and it was completely taken over so I do have some sense of how you know women felt when this came around last time right where we're still facing a lot of the same misinformation myths um, yeah. Fear messages, fear messages about basic equality. I just, I don't know if you have the language of the Equal Rights Amendment. Do you have it handy? Um, I have it pretty really well memorized, but I like to say it exactly. I didn't put it in the slides. I should have, though. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, as a woman growing up here in Utah, I, I really had kind of been taught that the Equal Rights Amendment was kind of this specter. You know, my, my sister had left our religion over this this amendment when, really? Sonia, wow. when yeah when Sonia Johnson was excommunicated by the church for her work with Mormons for ERA my sister left our religion and so as the oldest like you know her her story was this cautionary tale and so like the ERA was whispered at our house like it and when I actually read it I was in college and when I sat down and read the 24 words of the Equal Rights Amendment I thought to myself, are you kidding me? This is yeah. it? This is the thing that caused all of that turmoil and difficulty? Yeah. Like, it's so basic. It's so fundamental. It's so simple. And it's so needed. Will you read okay. that for us? Yes. So equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Boom. And that's, that's it. That's all. And the church That's uses, it. the church says in this pamphlet and elsewhere, they say that the, 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 the simplicity of it and the vagueness of it is so dangerous because it can mean a whole slew of things. Like they're saying that it needs to be more specific. It needs to be, it means to be complicated. It needs to be. Yeah. Is it, it has any person in opposition of the ERA offered changes to be made that would allow them to put it forward and not feel so worried about, about, it. about it yeah no i do think they would like it to just say woman i i worry that yeah, if that yeah. bill is suggested here in utah it could pass um our legislature is about 90 percent male and 90 percent lds <laughs> so it is um again it's a an issue of just representation we don't have the representation right now to stop it it's really concerning to me because, um, again, it's that exclusion. Like, I, I don't want my rights 
protected at the expense of someone else's. I, I don't yeah. want that. And I will actively work against that. Anyone who wants to propose that is not speaking for me. Um, let me just read to you from the Utah Constitution. The rights of citizens of the state of Utah to vote and hold office shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. I mean, just the exact same language, right? So it just, to me, that's been in our state constitution since 1890, 1896, 1896. Wow. And um, it just, it's, it's so fundamental. So if it's such a concern for the LDS church, if it's such a worry, then why in the world is it still in our state constitution? Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> good point. Yes. Yeah. So you said that in, what year was that? 2018 where the church came out and it spoke again? Oh, 19. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't the first time that we had run the bill. Uh, we started with Senator DeBacchus, who was amazing. He was such a great advocate. And a group called Utah Women Unite that Kate Kelly and Joanna Smith and other women started here in the wake of the 2016 um, lead up, you know, to, well, the election and just some, some concerning issues, right, for women. It felt like such an amazing time to just join in take action, try to make an impact. And so we started with Senator DeBacchus. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, it was not, it's never been allowed out of the Rules Committee and we've run it every year since. Uh, they, there's a group of nine people and there's always a majority Republicans uh, in that group. And they decide which bills can go forward. They sit down in like November and then the session doesn't even start until January, but they've already like prioritized what they are willing to put forward and what they will never want to see the light of day. And the ERA bill is always in that group, but yeah. we are committed to bringing it every year regardless. So we've just solidified with a, a representative um, to run it for this next session. And we just like, they can sit and deny it every year but we're going to make sure it comes in front of them every year. Well, so like with all the things we've just talked about, we've talked about these six main concerns that they talk about. And we, we talk about how they're not concerns or they're not really that big of an issue like abortion. Like that's less than 1% of women in this trimester. And, and then they're all for medical reasons. Anyway, like why is the church still against the ERA? Why is the church still against equal rights for women? Is it the same? Is it the same? <laughs> I, guess I, I guess I'm interested if they were to write a 2023 edition of this little booklet, what would it say? Like what it, it probably still hold to the abortion one and like the LGBTQ, but like, I, I don't know if these, it can hold on to very much. Like with all the points about the military, women are already there. Women are already not protected. I don't know what they would say, which is why I would love to sit down with them. And so we did make an effort to reach out through some, other channels and say, hey, could we sit down and talk to you about it? And uh, we were told no. So there is not a forum for us to discuss those issues. And I, I'm so sad about that because I see evidence of them wanting to understand women, wanting to understand why women are leaving, you know, wanting to understand why young people are leaving. They're, they're putting out these polls to people on the member roles um, where they're asking a lot of these questions, like really important questions that really should be asked right to a wider populace, a wider populace of, of, of folks. But I, I don't know. I, I believe that they are kicking against the pricks on this one. They absolutely are. Um, and here's why in 2020, we conducted two independent polls. So we didn't conduct them. Others did. So one was through, a, it was called Utah Policy. And the other one, Suffolk University with the Salt Lake Tribune. So two independent polls found that 71% of Utahns want the ERA ratified in our state. Yes. So th that's a high number. And with the great thing about the Utah policy poll is that they broke it down by like people, active members, people mm -hmm. that are still Mormon, but maybe don't attend. Like they broke it down by all these subsets to understand those numbers better it was like 80% of women in Utah support it in these in this poll, 60% of men. So not a huge shock there, but obviously a place to work. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to talk to others that don't think like us and educate them and bring them along with us, 
right? And we don't get there without men being equally invested in equality, right? So recognizing that equality is good for men, it's good for women, it's good for non-binary folks, it's good for all of us, right? Um, but th having those independent polls was such an important part of just realizing there is a shift happening. It's happening. <laughs> and whether whether um, religious organizations decide to get on board with that or not could really say a lot about their longevity. Again, I, I just that's the message that I would put out there. Like if you if you really are interested in understanding why folks leave, look at those issues of equality. And again, you know, you you said patriarchy and we laugh about it, but it's it's not it's kind of not a laughing matter, right? Because no, we laugh because we don't want to cry. <laughs> it's a reality that we are living in, right? It's a system that is not invested in women like it is in men and and benefit yet benefits from the unpaid and invisible labor of women. And I I I had a family member recently kind of want to debate me on this. And he's like, why should I stand up for women if women won't vote for their own interests? I was like, dude, that is a question. <laughs> that's a question I've had. Like, because that's, I think the hardest part of my advocacy work is seeing women not vote for their own interests, right? The hege hegemony that's involved in just like kind of accepting this system of patriarchy to the extent that they're the ones out in front saying, we don't need equality, right? Like that's what hurts my heart probably more than anything. And I, I don't have a great answer for him other than that I would say, I did ask him a question back. And this is, I think a great question for all of us just to take some inventory and self-reflect. Like, do I support systems that participate in the subjugation of women? I am not gonna tell you what he said. I'm not going to tell you how it went, but let's have these hard discussions in our families. Let's be willing to have these conversations because, you know, I need my brother to stand with me for my equality, um, just as I would stand with him for his. Um, I think that's the saddest part for me is, is just to see folks who say that they support or, you know, people that even think that they're progressive, right? Um, I think even they need to take inventory and say, in what ways am I potentially holding back equality for all people? Um, we, we all participate in these systems. There's not any of us that are, are not part of these systems, right? Uh, just as for me, it took a long time for me to kind of wake up to understand why the Equal Rights Amendment was even an issue. Like I, you know, I just, I had known about it probably my whole life a little bit, but not the specifics and not understanding what it really meant to women and how it could change women's lives. I, it took me a while to wake up to that. And so I'm trying to be patient with folks who maybe are on that journey of mm -hmm. figuring it out. Um, in Utah, our efforts are bipartisan we recognize that we cannot just be talking to the people that agree with us. We will never get anywhere here locally if we do that. We have to be willing to have difficult conversations, even with those who disagree. And the thing is that there are people that probably do agree with you that just don't understand. We just today were talking to your sister about how we were going to do this podcast. And she's like, what even is the ERA? And of course, once we explained it, she was like, well, of course, like, why don't we have this passed already? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of women who think that it's already in the constitution. They just don't know. Mm -hmm. like, yes. that's Yeah. That, that's a huge factor education. So that's our huge focus. If, if you pinned me down and said to me, Kelly, do you think that Utah will ratify the ERA? I would say to you, I don't know. I really don't know. I know it's a huge ask. It's a huge push. It would be very difficult here in our state right now, as it stands, to get it fully ratified here. Do I think the effort is worthwhile? Yes. Why? Because that independent poll showed me that our education efforts were are working, 
right? They're helping people have these hard conversations. Another exciting part is that we've been able to bring corporations along with us. We have ch other churches that are supportive of our efforts that are part of our coalition. We have cities and towns that have signed our resolution to ratify. So we're building coalition and we're building momentum and we're educating along the way. And to me, that's more important than reaching some finish line in the future. Our finish line will be on the national level. I know that in my heart. And I know that we're incredibly close. So if I was, you know, if you want to know kind of what it is that you can do, how can you be part of things? How can you join in? Start with where you are. So invest in your local communities, right? How, what are some of the groups and efforts working on women's rights issues in your community? Give them your support. Um, here in Utah, we have the Women's Democratic Club that is our new lead organization, kind of leading the way. Uh, Donna Kelly, who I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, she is going to be leading out on our ERA effort for the next few years. And again, with her background and history in sexual assault prosecution, she will be fantastic. That's like the next effort for the Utah ERA Coalition is, is to work there. You can join, we have a private page, Utah ERA Coalition. We have a public facing page, Utah Equal Rights uh, page on Facebook. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on TikTok. You know, we're, we're doing our best to spread the message about Utah, but wherever you are, if, if your state, find out if your state has ratified. If they haven't ratified, there is a national effort to help get them ratified. We meet, we talk on the phone, we have a Zoom call every other week with the National ERA Coalition. That's the next place to go. Go look up the National ERA Coalition and find out what they're doing. We are Black women-led on a national level, as we should have been and need to be. Um, and they that's where you can find any answers to all the questions that you have about the Equal Rights Amendment. They are actively involved. Find them on TikTok. Their TikToks are amazing. I repost their TikToks all the time. Um, and but they they are at the forefront. But another group within their group is called Generation Ratify. And these are young people who are working for the ERA. And um, they, yes. <laughs> they're not going to settle for just your, you know, your mom's ERA. They are <laughs> going to insist that <laughs> that the next the next phase be as inclusive and awesome as it should be. And so if you have some funds to donate. Go, those are great places to put your money. They um, So on the 100th anniversary of the ERA being presented in Seneca Falls, the Generation Ratified Group shut down Constitution Avenue, right, in insisting that the Equal Rights Amendment be certified. Um, the, several of them went to jail for a couple of nights. Um, wow. they're not, they are not afraid to put their bodies on the line. Susan B. Anthony when she got arrested. Yeah. For, for an equal future. I mean, they are that invested. It, talk yeah. about embodied activism. They're they're ready. Okay. Okay. So educate yourself, educate others about what the ERA even is. And then um, check to see if your state has ratified. I don't think Missouri, we're in Missouri. We, I don't think mm -hmm. Missouri has ratified we're, at all. This is such a fact. But state. you have a group active in working to ratify. And mm -hmm. I meet with I meet with leaders from all of the unratified states every other week on the national call with the National ERA Coalition. And we we share ideas, we share resources, we pump each other up. We are, I, you're gonna see some movement. And the idea being that if we can have a few more states ratify, it just provides that extra cushion so that some of those potential lawsuits for states who tried to rescind, that those would be even more moot if we have more states that ratify. So we still have an effort happening there in Florida. Um, Minnesota has a great effort going. Like we, um, we're working together and you can be part of that effort. If you're in an unratified state, join in and try to see what you could get going. If your state has ratified, look, look at your state constitution and see if it could be, if you could add an amendment to your state constitution if you could add an equality clause 
And I would direct you right back to Nevada, who has just passed the most inclusive state ERA in their constitution that we've ever seen. It's beautiful. Um, and we can be doing that in every state. Do you have the Nevada one available still? Yeah. To read? Let me pull that up. It said this. Nevada voters have adopted what is widely considered the most comprehensive state version of the Equal Rights Amendment in the nation. A sweeping update that puts protections in the state constitution for people who have historically been marginalized. Nevada's ERA amends the state constitution to ensure equal rights for all, regardless of race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender, identity or expression, age, disability, ancestry, or national origin. And that, that just passed this last year That's through so the cool. amazing efforts of Senator Pat Spearman, who has been an amazing champion for the ERA. And essentially her efforts to get Nevada to pass and to ratify the ERA in 2017, then spurred Illinois to do the same in 2018 and then Virginia to become the last and final state to ratify that was needed in 2020. So we are so close here to this finish line and we Congress has the power to remove the, the arbitrary timeline for the ERA. It, that timeline was placed in there, not even in the language of the ERA, it's like in a separate section and it was specifically put there to try and stop it. So um, Congress has, been given the power to extend that deadline in the past. It extended it three years. It can absolutely remove it. And we've come really close. The U.S. House of Representatives has voted twice, like I said, to remove the timeline. And just that has to now be taken up by the Senate and passed through both houses. But we're encouraged that we are right here so close. And, you know, to those who would say, why don't you just start over? <laughs> I say women have been working for a hundred years for this. You know, the efforts that we do, we stand on the shoulders of all of these amazing women working for this effort over a hundred years. There's just no way that you can set it down. And there's a great quote by um, Alice Paul that basically says that you can't set down your hoe till you get to the end of the row. You know, she spent her lifetime fighting for this. I care so much about that. I, I absolutely will dedicate my life to it as well. And I, what I would ask is like, we just need more, right? We need people having these conversations, um, educating. Our younger generation hasn't really heard about the ERA. Let's educate, let's let this younger generation know what's happening with the Equal Rights Amendment, what it means, why it's so important. Let's clear away the misinformation and the fear messages that get us nowhere. They do nothing for us. Um, they do nothing to advance greater equality for all people. That would be way more hopeful after this than I'm watching Mrs. America. Phyllis <laughs> <laughs> Schlafly was like the devil, that lady, I tell you. She was a working attorney while yeah. she was telling everybody to be a housewife. She was right, such a hypocrite. Like and just yeah. working against her own interests. It's really sad. Well, I think the show does the, like it's Kate Blanchett who plays her. And I think they do a really good job showing that she's kind of this hypocrite where it's like, yeah. she would benefit so much from having this ERA passed and ratified or, or certified. Like, yeah. It's wild, wild stuff. Yeah. Well, the harm, the harm of the Phyllis Schlafly's of this world is that she inspired what's called the Eagle Forum here in Utah. I don't know if you know the Eagle Forum. Just what was um, in the show. Gail Rizika, Phyllis Schlafly was her mentor. And she is working every day. She's up at the legislature working. Uh, when we were working to pass our bill, she had two people kind of dressed like missionaries standing at the door of the House of Representatives with the Stop ERA, Stop ERA badges. Um, and the sad part is like most of her lobbyists are young people. Mm -hmm young students. So it is, I'd like to say, you know, that Phyllis Schlafly is a thing of the past, but she inspired a movement that still exists to shut down LGBTQ rights and women's rights here in Utah. And she's, she's a permanent fixture in our legislative session. So I hate wow. 
there's a lot of work to be done. I, I actually, I got to moderate a debate <laughs> between her and Senator Reby, who is, re who is running for office. She's running for our Congressional District 2, where Chris Stewart has been. He's stepping down and she's running right now. Um, between her and Gail Ruzica, we were able to do like a, an online debate where she literally said this quote. She said, women don't want to be equal. Women don't want to be paid equally. Women don't want to be equal. It's crazy. Speaking enough. for all women? <laughs> yeah. I know. What, what about, what about um, these cases with Dukes and, and Ledbetter? And like, what? That makes no sense. That makes no sense. No, they invited me on KSL, which is like our church-owned radio station. I've been on KSL. I was on there as a missionary. <laughs> to do like this talk show. And then they had her come on right after. It's like, oh, it just, it's so sad. I hope, I don't think her message resonates with the young people. I'll just say that. We're going to, we're entering a new era. I think, I think where you're going to see that change. We're in this step back moment, but you're going to see that just get pushed forward. I, I really know it. Yeah, so there's this idea of, I read about it in a book about racism and it also applies here. There's a term called a pick me woman where like you're just, your uh, proximity to power keeps you from speaking for yourself. But, um, and like the, those that are actually like you, um, I think it also applies to capitalism. It's like, if you can be close to the people who have power, then, then you'll speak for them and you'll be on yeah. their side, yeah. even though you're hurting yourself as well as all the people who are like you. And right. I think that's what's happening here is like, like proximity. I feel like Phyllis Schlafly, she's like, I have power. I have, people are listening to me. I'm going to continue to push this despite it actively being hypocritical. And I don't hurting know. her, right? Like, I mean, that's us being trained to speak against our own interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that to me is the saddest part. That's the yeah. saddest part. Because that means we've internalized misogyny on such a deep level. Yeah, it's deep, deep level. And we even, like, like I've been uh, a feminist for probably eight or 10 years by now, but oh, I still will nice. catch myself being, like, thinking things that I... And they say like your first thought is your training, your second thought is actually you. So I'm like, I have to give myself some grace because sometimes I'm yeah. like, oh whoa, have, that was not. You have to give yourself grace. In this yeah, process. you do. We like, have to give that's when I was talking to my brother. Oh, he says to me, well, what about your marriage? He's like, do you have an equal marriage? And he was like, wanting me to like dive in there. And I, you know, I I just kind of took a deep breath and I just said, we're always working for a more equal marriage, right? And and I just think that's what we can do, right? Certainly, you know, if you looked at my, my personal timeline, I fell into a pretty traditional roles. I stayed home with three kids. Um, I ultimately did go back to get a master's and go work, right? But, um, but even though we consider ourselves to be fairly progressive, we, we fell into some of those roles. Um, it's, it's really hard to resist that. And so I do think, you know, as a 40, uh, I turned 50 in a couple of weeks. Oh, as a, um, yeah, as an almost 50 year old woman, I think, um, you know, every, there's all these transitions. So our kids are now all three out of the house at college. And it's like, you know, it's a whole new start for our relationship. It's like a hearkening back to when we first started, when we both really were on pretty equal footing, education, work you know, pay all of those kinds of things, then things really changed in that middle place. And then, you know, now finally kind of getting to redesign and reimagine and, and realize some of the places where we have fallen into our conditioning and, and trying to, like I said, continue to work on a more equal marriage. I think we're all, yeah, we're all part mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. We're all working on it. Even we're working on it. Yes. <laughs> you can yes easy but it, you surprisingly no. no it isn't like I one quick example I'll give you is that my husband like he would just um reach for the keys when we would head out somewhere and I would just give them to him <laughs> but I was a little pissed about it 
And I think it's because as a mom, I was often the passenger, like keeping the kids quiet while he drove or whatever. But, you know, as a youngest of eight kids, I was always in the back. You don't know how long it took me to get to the front seat. <laughs> so long. Uh, we had one of those green internationals that had like 15 seats in it. It was yeah, like, we had a 15 passenger van too. Oh, it was insane. So I, you know, it really did bother me. And I finally was like, dude, that's my car. I like to drive. Yeah. Um, when we're going somewhere and we're going in that car, I'm driving. Let's let that be the default. And it just like, I don't think he was ill-intentioned. I don't think just he wanted to, to make me feel bad. We had just fallen into this weird little pattern and it's been different ever since, but it did take me like realizing and speaking up and then him being receptive to that. And, you know, that's such a process. One thing I love about dating a woman is that you have to like, everything's like, we're like, well, what roles do we do? Like, so it's just clear, like we have to decide. You're making it as you go along. Yeah, exactly. And I love that. There's not a, there's not a pre- Mm-hmm. all these yeah. preconceived ideas yeah. so her one of her cousins who's he's he's a funny guy he's really sweet he's but he does have some very misogynistic points of view he asks us all the time who's the man in our relationship and what we'll, i'll we'll joke with him and i'll make some <laughs> sort of inappropriate jokes um but last time i was i was talking to him and i was telling him how julia was doing really well in her career and he's like oh so she's the man in the relationship i was like well wait how, how do you define because is it the person who makes the most money or is it the person who fixes everything? Cause I fix everything. She makes all the money. And he's like, mm-hmm. okay, you're the man of the relationship. I was like, all right. Who's wearing uh, pants? Let's see those yeah, pants. Right. We're all wearing pants. <laughs> We're We're all out. wearing pants, which I love that mm-hmm. so much. Yeah. I love that. Just silly. imagine a world where gender, where we don't give a, fuck about gender yes oh my yes. goodness yes like we yes. all like, gender like, neutral you think you're good at like when it comes to driving i drive in the city and she drives the long distances because i fall asleep while i'm driving and she gets lost in the city like do what you're good at don't just yeah. do like do what yeah. you're good at i love that like just like that about my husband being very nurturing like i mean imagine not being able to feel like you could do that just because you were a guy right yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. yeah, or make decisions just because you're like I don't know, like I I feel like I'm a very good um man. I, so I was married to a man for seven years, and I remember one of the things Less. that there was a lot of <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you, bless, bless you too, thank you. Thirty, we're coming up on thirty. It's no oh, nice. Uh, good, great. that's great. That's beautiful. Anyway, so there was one thing that stood out to me as like kind of a an example of how things went in my marriage. Um, so we were at the family table. I had made dinner. I had set the table. Everybody had come to sit at the table. And I said, uh, so-and-so, will you say the prayer? And my husband turned to me and said, I pick who says, says the prayer. And I was like, what? And he's like, I'm the patriarch. I need to be deciding who says the prayer. And I was like, I don't think that's, I don't think there's like a rule about that. Is there like, I, there is a rule. There literally is a rule. Yeah, yeah. apparently. And like, was, there's also a rule of like what order you can say the prayers. If a man and woman are giving the prayers, like has to be the man oh, first. Like there yeah, are these yeah. weird, weird, there are weird rules around that. Well, and then women couldn't even pray in general conference until 2013. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's only 10 years but ago. Yeah, like, yeah, there how, are rules. how did we survive this? I do yeah. not even I know. don't know. But it was <laughs> a... Still, still surviving still surviving but yeah thank god on the other side of things oh. yeah <laughs> on the other side of things yeah yeah like just even if you do dig into the history i don't know if you you said you might do that oh, um, i would love to do that like i'm just thinking of, yeah. i um, i'm starting my master's program in january and i need to figure out what my thesis is going to be on and i keep thinking like i should do it on like some kind of like the equal rights or something like that like i don't know oh you yeah, really I'm should thinking. you really should so i fun. Um, I, I kind of said like the LGBTQ issues were the main reason to kind of push my own spiritual development, but, um, but reading Sonia Johnson's book from Housewife. Not, still, oh, that one. Yeah. Oh yeah. I need to read that one. That uh, book, uh, created a major shift in me. It's not like all of the feminist pieces were there on my shelf. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um, and that was a lot of shelf. 
who was it? I don't know where I heard it. Maybe on Jan, that Jan Tyler episode where she described organized religion as elementary school or primary uh -huh. school. And I just thought that's such a beautiful way to think of it as being, uh -huh. as being just that start to our religious experience. And then, you know, we get to open it up and to be whatever yeah. it is we need it to be. So yeah. we're on a good path. We're on a good journey, y'all. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so thank you so much for joining us, Kelly. Can we have people follow your socials? Like, what can we do to help people to support you? Like, yeah, what are your join in? So you can find a lot of our work online at uh, www.utahera.org. That's our web page. Um, you can find us on social media at equal Equal Rights for Utah is okay. you can find us we're on instagram twitter we're on tiktok barely we're barely on tiktok <laughs> <laughs> and but we are also on we have a public facing facebook page we have a private group for those who want to join in our efforts on a more intimate level um on the day-to-day -day, like how can you volunteer how can you get invested so yeah definitely jump on and and check out those sites because we need your voice we need all of you to speak up for greater equality. That's great. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, and, and so hopefully, you. yeah. So hopefully, we'll have you on again and we'll talk about this more because this is so fascinating Please. to me. Yeah, yeah so I'm happy to come back anytime. We would love that. Yeah. And the, to the viewers, if you have any specific um, topics that you are interested in, you would like for us to discuss, we would love to uh, delve deeper into what you guys are interested in. Um, yeah. So we have a Patreon. If you want to donate, we have the website. It has like links everywhere. Um, to donate to us as well. So analyzingmormonism.com, um, analyzing Mormonism on mm -hmm. TikTok, uh, Instagram, uh, Instagram YouTube. and YouTube, yeah, um, and your Patreon mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So, would, uh, yeah. so please support, um, so we can keep this going. Yes, for us, support Kelly. Please go support Kelly because this is this is way bigger than that's than, way bigger than us. Yeah, yeah <laughs> way more. Important. I love what you do. What you oh, do is you. super important too. Hopefully, we'll get together with you soon, and then we'll see, hopefully we'll see you guys in a week. So. Thank you so much, Kelly. Let's talk again. Okay. Bye.